Hello, I'm Brian Tracy, and welcome to this program on time management. There's probably no skill that's more closely correlated with success and achievement in every part of your life than the ability to manage your time well. It'll bring you to the attention of your superiors faster. It'll help you to get more done in a shorter period of time. It'll make you feel better about yourself. It'll lead to faster promotions, higher status, greater pay, and everything. And in the time that we have together, I'm going to share with you some of the methods, techniques, and ideas used by the most superior time managers, men and women in every area of endeavor in America. Time management is essential to your health as well. Not just your productivity, but you only feel good about yourself to the degree to which you feel you're in control of your time and your life. In fact, the major reason for stress in America is a feeling of being out of control, a feeling of having too much to do and too little time to do it in. In this program, you're going to learn how to gain at least two hours per day. You may be able to increase your time management effectiveness by 50% or even double your output. So one of the most important things that you think about, and we'll come back to this in a few minutes, is what would you do if you could increase your output by 25 or 50 percent per day? What would it mean to you if you could double your productivity, which you can if you just use these techniques over and over again? Well, there's four requirements for you to make these techniques work for you. We call these the four Ds. The first D is desire. It's want. You must have a burning desire to be effective at time management. The second D is decision. You must make a decision that you are going to become an expert in this subject. You are going to take this course, you're going to use these materials, you're going to practice them over and over again, because what we have found is in the absence of a decision, nothing ever happens. You need a clear, unequivocal, do or die, burn the bridges decision that this is a subject that you are going to master. The third D is discipline. You must discipline yourself to practice and repeat over and over again good time management techniques. In fact, we say that time management is self-discipline in action. And the ability to discipline yourself more than anything else is going to determine your success in life. And the fourth D to become excellent in time management is determination. You must have the ability to persist. You must have the determination to keep on keeping at it, on at it long enough until you become very, very good in this field. But I promise you this, the payoff is tremendous because, you see, time management is really life management. Everything that you do to improve the quality of your time management will improve and enhance every part of your life. You can even say it this way, the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your time management. The quality of your life will be determined by the way you use your time minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, because your time is your life. So let's talk about a psychology of time management. How do we change our mindset in such a way that we become really, really effective at managing our time? Well, we start off with this very simple fact is that your beliefs equal your realities. The way that you manage your time now, in fact, every single part of your life is determined by your beliefs about that part of your life. If you believe that you are an excellent time manager, that you are effective and efficient and productive and a high achiever, then you will be. However, most people have funny beliefs about time management. Sometimes they believe they're good at it when they're not, but mostly they believe that if you uh, manage your time too well, you are not as spontaneous or as natural or as normal. The fact of the matter is, the better you manage your time, the more you can be completely spontaneous and free. So the starting point of a psychology of time management is number one, is to recognize that your time equals your money and your time and money equals your life. That what we're talking about here is life management, but we're also talking about money management. You notice that you can exchange time for money, and you can also pay money in order to buy time. But both time and money combined equal life or happiness. When we talk about time management, what we're talking about is having enough time so that we can be happier in every aspect of our life. We can be happier at our work, we can have more time for our relationships, more time for our health, more time for personal and professional development, more time for emotional and spiritual growth, and so on. So therefore, when you begin to look upon time, when your belief begins to shift so that you see time as the fundamental resource of life, then your attitude toward the way you use your time begins to change. Now, the second key in the psychology of time management is your self-image. Now, what do we know about self-image? We know that the way you see yourself your inner mirror determines your external performance. The way you see yourself, and we have a phenomenon called self-image modification. 
What does that mean? It means that if you continue to see yourself and think of yourself as an excellent time manager, your external performance begins to change and begin, you begin to use your time more effectively. How do you change your self-image? Well, one of the ways is by questioning and changing your self-ideal. You see, our self-image is largely formed by the people that we admire and look up to, whether we know them personally or read about them or something else. So a good question is, in terms of time management, who do you most admire and respect? Who would you most like to be like? Who do you feel is really well organized and very productive and gets a lot done? What you do is you begin using that person as your ideal and patterning your behavior after the most effective time manager that you know. And surprise, surprise, your own time management starts to get better. And this brings us to the most important part of the human psyche, which is your self-esteem. Now, your self-esteem has been defined many ways, but your self-esteem is largely how much you like yourself how much you respect yourself, how much you value yourself. And what we've determined is that underlying self-esteem is what is called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy means that you like yourself to the degree to which you feel you are effective at performing what's important to you. So every single act of time management where you feel more effective and more capable and more competent causes your self-esteem to go up. It causes you to like yourself more and makes you more effective, better, more personable, more relaxed, happier in every part of your life. So, again, the fourth key in the psychology of time management is to see yourself as a poor time manager. To start off with and say, imagine for right now that I am a poor time manager, that I'm not particularly good. And the reason for this is simply this. Many people, if they are convinced they already know something, make no effort to learn it. But if they're convinced that they don't know it, and that there's an enormous amount to learn, they become hungry for knowledge. So imagine that you don't know very much about time management. Don't run, make the mistake that the unconscious incompetent does. This is the person who does not know and does not know that they do not know. This is a person who falls into the intelligence trap of the low performer. They convince themselves that they don't need to learn anything and they can't be taught anything. This is the truly hopeless case. So imagine you're a terrible time manager and that everything you're about to learn is vitally important to your success and your promotion. Number five key in the psychology is look upon time management as a vehicle. Time management is a vehicle. It's a tool. It gets you from where you are now in your life to where you want to go in the future. Do you want to increase your income? Do you want to increase your uh, level of performance and output? Do you want to increase the quality of your life, your position, your status? Time management is how you get there. Remember, time management is life management. It's the way you use your time in your life that will determine where you are now, where you'll be in a week, a month, a year, where you'll end up. So look upon it as a vehicle. Look upon it as a calculator or a computer that you can learn to operate in order to get yourself to where you want to go faster and more efficiently. Number six is imagine that you can gain two hours per day. Two hours per day will translate into roughly 10 hours per week, and 10 hours per week will tr translate roughly into about 500 hours per annum. Ask yourself what you would do with a 25% increase in your productivity and performance. What would you do with the time? You see, what we know is the more you are clear about how you would use the time you would save, the more likely it is that you will engage in the activities that allow you to save the time. What would you do with a 25% increase in your time? Some people write books. Some people dramatically increase their performance and their output in their chosen career. Some people are more effective in other things that they do. So first of all, decide why you want the time, and the more you want the time, the more you intense your desire to get that time, the more likely it is that you'll learn the skills. Number seven, the key to your rewards in life, both tangible and intangible, is the level of your service. You will always be paid in direct proportion to the value of your service to other people. So one of the very smartest things you can do is to always think in terms of how you can increase the value of your service. Because if you increase the value of your service, you'll increase everything else. Number eight is to remember the difference between failures and successes is simply this, is that successes are more productive. They use their time well. Failures work the same number of hours and sometimes even more hours, but you know what happens? Is they're not very productive. They work at low value tasks. They get very little done. The fact of life is you'll always be paid for what you produce. If you want to earn more, achieve more, you must produce more. 
you must concentrate on what successful people do, which is producing things that are better and more valuable than others. Number nine is what is called the factory model. Now, the factory model simply says that a factory has three parts. It has inputs, it has activities, and it has outputs. And your job is to produce outputs. You will always be paid for the quality plus the quantity of your outputs. And one of the most important questions to ask yourself all the time is what outputs have I been hired to accomplish? The great majority of people get tied up in activities and they spend all of their days engaging in activities, but they lose sight of the outputs. The most productive people in America are intensely focused on outputs. Number 10 is that the key to motivation, to feeling terrific about yourself, to having high energy, to having high self-esteem, to have a positive mental attitude, is achievement. It goes back to self-efficacy, but whenever you achieve something important, your motivation goes up. Now, what does this mean? It means working on low-value tasks, even if you complete them, gives you no bang for the buck. You only get motivation, you only get excitement and enthusiasm when you complete a high-value task. Think in terms of high value because the psychological impact can be tremendous. Your most positive people are those who are producing and achieving at high levels. Remember that time management is a skill. It's a skill like anything else which is learnable. Just like you learned how to ride a bicycle or operate a computer or work a calculator or do mathematics, you can learn a time management skill by practice and repetition over and over again, and it'll serve you all the days of your life. By the way, one of the very best uses of time is to develop a skill that enables you to save time for months and even years. Number 12 is new habits of time management or anything else take about 21 days. So make the decision that you're not going to try to change the whole world, but as you go through this program, you're going to pick one time management habit at a time, and you're going to work on that until you have locked it in, and then another, and then another. So when you launch a new habit, launch strongly. Never allow exceptions. Keep at it over and over again until it's locked in, until you feel uncomfortable if you don't do it. Number 13 is to remember this, is that time management is your key to the future. It's your key to the future. Everything that you ever will be is determined by your ability to manage your time. Everything that you could ever want or dream of in life is going to be determined by how you utilize your time between now and there. Number 14, remember that time management as we said before, is a discipline. Time management is a series of habits that require repetition and practice, and the ability to manage your time is a measure of self-control, self-mastery, self-discipline. It's a measure of your overall character. Every single act of self-discipline in managing your time better increases your ability to discipline yourself in every other area. Every single time management skill that you learn increases your ability to use other time management skills. But every laxity in discipline in time management causes your level of discipline in other areas to decrease simultaneously. It's very, very important. Number 15, there's a direct relationship between the amount of control that you feel that you have in your life and the amount of freedom that you feel that you have. We have what we call the law of control, which says that you feel positive about yourself to the degree to which you feel you're in control of your own life. And you feel negative about yourself to the degree to which you feel you are out of control. We say that you have the same sense of freedom. The more you feel in control, the freer you feel, and the more is your positive mental attitude. You feel more positive about yourself to the degree to which you feel you're in control, and you feel negative, you have a negative mental attitude to the degree to which you feel you're out of control, and time management gives you control. Number 16, remember the only time you'll ever have is now. Don't worry about the past. Discard past labels with regard to time management. Focus on today, this hour, this minute, and manage your time now, and the future will take care of itself. Number 17, remember the key to leadership is two things. The first is performance. The key to leadership is the ability to get the job done. And the second part of leadership is results, intense result orientation. Number 18, we're getting to the end, is set a good example. Imagine yourself as a role model for others. One of the very best ways to teach yourself time management is to look upon yourself as a role model. And number 19, remember this, the greatest motivator for becoming good at time management is that there are high payoffs involved. 
high payoffs in terms of earning more money, feeling more satisfied, being happier, having higher levels of self-esteem, feeling terrific about yourself, coming to the attention of your superiors. When you become excellent in time management, your future is literally guaranteed. Your job is to become an expert at time management. And to become an expert at time management means that you have to become excellent at setting very clear goals and objectives for every area of your personal and especially your work life. In fact, your ability to set goals and clear objectives can increase your productivity by as much as 50%, literally overnight, by becoming far more clear about what it is you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it. We always encourage people to ask, what am I trying to do? How am I trying to do it? What am I trying to do? How am I trying to do it? And as many as 80% of people working today are not really clear about the answers to those two questions. In fact, if you ask what the major source of stress is in the American workplace, interviewing thousands of workers, it's not knowing what's expected. Not knowing what's expected. So your ability to set very clear goals and objectives for your work is going to have more of an effect on what you produce than anything you can imagine. In fact, the very worst waste of time is to do very well what need not be done at all. So we talk about goals and objectives. We start off with what we call MBO, or Management by Objectives. Now, Management by Objectives means that you keep yourself on track by working consistently toward accomplishing very clear, specific objectives that are fundamental to your success in your work and in your personal life. We start off by personal MBO, and we encourage you to set goals in three critical areas of your life. The three critical areas First of all, you need goals in your personal areas, your personal and family. These are your reasons why. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you working at what you're working? What's the purpose of your life? People who are the most productive in their work lives are perfectly clear about why they're doing what they do. Now, the second part of your goals, or the second type of goals, are what we call your career and your financial goals. And these are what we call the how. These are how you get from where you are to where you want to be. These are how you achieve what you want to accomplish. And the third type of goals that you have to set are your personal and professional development goals. These professional and professional development goals are the what. By learning the what, you learn how to do the how, and the how enables you to have the why. So when we talk about management by objectives, there are four keys to management by objective. For anything that you have to do, here's the four. First is definition. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Be very clear and be clear on paper. Number two is a clear measure. How are you going to know that you've accomplished it? If you're setting objectives with someone else or someone else is setting objectives with you, be very adamant. If you take a job, say, what do I have to do in order to get a, to raise, in order to get paid more money? The third is a plan. How are you going to get from where you are to where you want to go? And the fourth is very simple. What is your schedule? What is your timeline? Every goal must be time-bounded. Now, this brings us back to what we call your major definite purpose. Your major definite purpose is your most important number one goal. So in setting your life and organizing your life to manage by objectives, we say, first of all, ask yourself, what would I want to be, have, or do in every area of my life if I had unlimited time, unlimited money, unlimited resources? Create for yourself a dream list. Write down everything that you would want to be or have or do in the next 5 or 10 or 15, 20 years or in the whole, your whole life. Then take and go over that list and say, what one great thing would I dare to dream if I knew I could not fail? What one great thing would I want to accomplish if I knew I could not fail? And make that your major definite purpose. Once you have a clear sense of your objectives and your goals and what are most important, then you can sit down, begin to organize your life and your productivity is going to go up dramatically. In fact, we say, if we take number two, we say that the key to life is goal setting because goal setting is the master skill. Goal setting is the master skill. 
Your ability to set goals and to make written plans for their accomplishment is more important to you than any other single skill. An average person with very clear goals and plans is going to supersede and do far better than a superior person who doesn't have them. My wife has a SureShot camera. Now, a SureShot camera is beautiful in that it is calibrated so that when you aim it at something, it focuses automatically. A friend of mine who's a professional photographer and wins international prizes has a $10,000 Hasselblad. Yet my wife can take better photographs than my friend all day, every day, if my friend is not allowed to do just one thing, and that is to focus. So you find that a person who can focus with average capabilities is far more effective than a person who cannot focus who has superior capabilities. Your ability to write out your goals and make plans for their accomplishment is the master skill of success. Now, the third key is to ask this question, why are you on the payroll? With regard to your work, why are you on the payroll? Why? What have you been hired to accomplish? If you were to go to your boss, if you were to look at your job description, if you were to look at what you are expected to accomplish every single day, why are you on the payroll? It's the fundamental question of success in the world of work. Once you ask this, ask this question, another way of asking the same question is what are your key result areas? You have been hired to achieve a variety of results. What are your key result areas? The ability to clearly establish key result areas is to look at all the things that you have to do and pick your number one key result area, your number two key result area, and so on, is the essence of high performance. So what are your key result areas? Why have you been hired? Why, what are you in the payroll for? What can you and only you do that if done really well will make a real difference? Now, number five is what are your core functions? Again. A part of managing by objectives and setting goals is to clearly define your core functions. Now, your core functions are the functions upon which everything else you do depends. If these are done extremely well, that everything else is secondary to it. For example, the core function of a salesperson may be uh, seeing qualified prospects and making presentations. If the salesperson does that, then the sales, uh, the orders, the implementation, the service, uh, the revenues, everything else will take care of that. So ask yourself, what are my core functions? Because the natural tendency of most people is to focus on ancillary functions and become very busy engaged in activities and lose sight of their goals. And one of the most common mistakes of mankind is to forget what you originally started out to do and get sidetracked into other things of lesser importance. Now, the sixth thing is to ask yourself, what are your output responsibilities? What are your output responsibilities? What does that mean? That means what outputs has your personal factory been put on the payroll to produce? What are the outputs that are expected of you? There are four ways that you define an output. The first is that it is under your control. An output is something that you can do, that you don't need anybody else's permission for, but you control the job totally. If you don't do it, it's not done. A second way that you can define an output is that it becomes an input for somebody else. Every output is a completed job. We call this uh, a completed staff function. In other words, when it's done, it goes from you to someone else, and someone else has to use it as part of their work or their life. The output of a factory may be a finished product. The output of a lawyer may be a completed brief. The output of an accountant may be a financial statement, and so on. The third is that an output is measurable. An objective third party can tell whether or not it has been accomplished. Someone can come along and say, yes, it's done, or no, it hasn't been done. So uh, what, how, and how would you measure your output responsibilities? And number four, critically important, your success or lack of success in your work and your career is determined by the quality and quantity of your outputs. So we are on the payroll in every case to produce outputs that are under our control, that are measurable, that become an input for someone else, and which determine our success. Remember, we are not on the payroll to perform activities, to socialize, to get along, but to get the job done and to produce the most important key result areas. Now, the next question that you have to ask, question number seven, is who are your customers? You see, we are all in the business of customer satisfaction. Robert W. Service said that everybody makes their living by selling something to someone. So who are your customers? And who do you have to satisfy in order to be promoted? You see, your customers are the people who determine your success or failure in your career. Sam Walton was once asked by a journalist, wasn't it nice to be at the top of your corporation and not to have to worry about pleasing anybody else? And you know what he said? He said, you're wrong. 
He said, I have to please my customers every single day. He said, and there comes one walking through the door right now. And he pointed to someone walking through the door of a Walmart store. He said, that's the person I work for. That's my boss. That's the customer, the satisfaction of whom determines everything that happens to me. Now, principle number eight is what do we call a six-step method of setting goals? And it's very, very simple, but it's simply this. Step number one is to write out all the goals you can think of. What are all the things that you want to do? Step number two is to set priorities. Of all these goals, which are most important? Step number three is to write out uh, and create plans for accomplishing your most important goals. Step number four is to set priorities on your plans and activities. Uh, step number five is to schedule your plans, decide what you're going to do and when, and ske step number six is to implement, is to get busy. Now this seems very simple, but the very act of doing this can change your whole life and your whole career. Every single person needs a series of goals. You need 10-year goals. You need 5-year goals. You need 3-year goals. You need 1-year goals, and you need 6-month goals. You even need lifetime goals. You need goals that organize every part of your life. One of the great exercises in life is to write your own obituary and ask yourself where you want to be in 3, 5, 10 years, or what do you want to be read over your grave? What kind of a person do you want to come, become? Sometimes people say, well, I can't set goals like this because they're too big or they're too challenging or they're too impossible, but here's the question. Is what, what, what one great thing would you dare to dream if you knew you could not fail? There are no such thing as unrealistic goals, only unrealistic time frames. Now, number 10 is ask yourself, what are the obstacles that stand between you and your goals? What are the obstacles that stand between you and your goals? What is stopping you from getting from where you are to where you want to go. And what is the number one obstacle? What is the biggest single obstacle and what could you do starting today to remove it? Number 11 is what people do you need to work with to achieve your goal? Whose cooperation do you require in order to accomplish your goal and what's in it for them? Who are the most important people? The members of your family, the members of your uh, company, the people you work with, your boss and so on. But who are the people whose cooperation you require and the twelfth question is, what additional knowledge do you require in order to achieve your goal? What knowledge, what skills, what information, and what is the number one knowledge, skills, and information that you require in order to get from where you are to where you want to go? So this is it. Decide what you want. Decide the obstacle stopping you from getting it. Decide the people whose help you require. Decide the uh, additional knowledge you need, and then schedule and implement. Number. Uh, it's 15, number, I'm sorry, number tw 13 is ask yourself, what is the limiting step between you and your goal? The limiting step also becomes a goal because this is what determines the speed at which you achieve your goal. This is the choke point. This is the critical factor that is the bottleneck between you and wherever it is you want to go. So what is your limiting step between where you are and where you want to be? Number 14 is the need for clarity. Now here's an important point is the more clear you are about your goals and objectives, the easier it is for you to accomplish them. The more clear you are about what you want, the more clear your mental pictures of reality, the more likely it is that you will move step by step from where you are to where you want to go. Clarity enables you to visualize. And we know that all really successful men and women are capable of seeing the goal clearly in their mind before they realize it. The more time that you spend writing out your goal or your objective, and clearly describing it, especially describing what it will look like when it's complete, the more likely it is that you will achieve it. All of our exercises, our exercise of dreaming big dreams, writing down all your goals, going through and setting priorities on the goals, making plans, setting priorities on the plans, scheduling, implementing, and so on, are all part of helping you see with crystal clarity what you're trying to accomplish. Asking questions every single day. Why am I on the payroll? What have I been hired to accomplish? What are my key result areas? What are your key result areas? What have you been hired to accomplish? If you could only do one thing in your job each day, what one thing would make the greatest contribution to your company? If you could only make one uh, contribution or perform in one area, performance in what one single area would contribute the most to your career? Number, number 15 is to dream big dreams. Dream big dreams. All men and women who are really successful have gotten into the habit of dreaming big dreams and then make them come true. Make them come true. You see, the dreamers 
are the movers and shakers. They're the lotus eaters. They're the men and women who have made everything happen. So have big dreams for yourself. Dream about becoming a big success. Dream about moving to the top of your field. Dream about being the very best. Dream about being excellent in your chosen field. And finally, the final point on goals is this, is to write and rewrite your goals every day. Every single day, write a clear statement of what it is you want to accomplish, where you want to go, what you want to do. If someone were to wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, what do you want to do with your life? What are your major goals? What's your major definite purpose? You should be able to tell them just like that. This is what I want to accomplish and when I want to accomplish it and how I'll measure it and how it will be done. So write and rewrite your goals every morning. Review those goals at the end of every day. Plan and organize your time every minute. And develop within yourself the goal-setting master skill of success. Once you have clear goals and priorities organized in order of importance, your ability to set priorities and to stick to those priorities is absolutely essential to your personal and professional effectiveness. In this session, we're going to talk about the key ideas and rules that you can use in order to set priorities and to get more done. Recently, in a study of 104 chief executive officers, they asked them what were the qualities that would be most likely to put a young person onto the fast track in his or her career. And the number one quality agreed to by more than 85% of the executives was the ability to set priorities, the ability to select the relevant from the irrelevant. And I've discussed this with thousands of managers over time. And you know what I found out is they all say the same thing. Their biggest source of frustration is people who are not working on the most important use of their time. So let's talk about some of the keys to setting priorities. Key number one is what is called the 80-20 rule. Now everybody's heard about the 80-20 rule. It's called the Pareto Principle. It was developed by an Italian economist named Vilfredo Pareto in 1895. And what he discovered is over a large enough number of samples that 20% of what you do accounts for 80% of your results. 20% of your customers account for 80% of your sales. 20% of your products account for 80% of your profits. 20% of your transactions require 80% of the time involved. So the 80-20 rule says to Pareto everything is to always be looking at what you have to do and say, what are the 20% of the things that I do that are most important to my success, both in the short term and in the long term? Look at your whole company. Look at all of your activities. What are the 20% of the things that you do that give you the greatest bang <laughs> for the buck? Now, the second key to setting priorities is to distinguish between the urgent and the important. Now, this is one of the most important of all concepts. And it simply says this is that there are four different types of things that you do on a daily basis. And you can divide them into four quadrants. If you take these four quadrants, you find that there are things that are urgent and things that are not urgent. And there are things that are important and things that are not important. Now, the first quadrant is quadrant one. These are the things that are both urgent and important. Telephones ringing, people coming in, mail, a temporary crisis, problems, interruptions, and so on. Most people spend most of the time working in the area of the urgent and apparently immediately important. The second quadrant are the things that are important but not urgent. The third area are the things that are urgent but not important. For instance, somebody calling you but it's not a particularly important thing. And the fourth area are the things that are neither urgent nor important. What is it that the average person does and that you have to get free of? Well, they work in quadrant number one all the time because these are pressing. They, when they cut, get cut up with quadrant number one, they drop to quadrant number three, and they do what is urgent but not important. If they get caught up with quadrant number three, they relax and pay themselves off by doing things in quadrant number four, things that are neither urgent nor important. However, it is in working more in quadrant two, doing the things that are important to your career and to your life, but which are not particularly urgent that you can increase your effectiveness dramatically. These are working on your personal and professional skills, spending time with your family, working on long-term reports, upgrading your abilities, and so on. The things that are important but not urgent are the most vital things to your long-term future. So a critical part of setting priorities is to ask yourself, what are the important things that I have to do but which are not urgent? 
Because remember this, important but not urgent will eventually be very urgent and sometimes it will be too late. The third key to setting priorities is to ask yourself, what are your personal values? One of the things that we know is you always have to be working at goals that are congruent with your values. So when we talked about goals, we talked about what are the most important goals. With regard to values and priorities, you have to say, what is most important to me? What do I believe in? What do I stand for? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And you'll find that high performance comes when your goals and your values are congruent, and low performance comes when your goals and your values clash with each other, when you're working at something that is inconsistent with what is really important. And this brings us to number four key in priorities. What are your unique strengths? Again, when we look at the most effective men and women in our society, we find that every one of them has taken the time to think through what they are particularly good at. What are you particularly good at? What are the strengths and abilities that have led to your success in life to date? What is it that you do easier that comes difficult to other people? What are you especially good at doing? Leaders are those who deploy themselves carefully and they only work in areas where they can employ their unique strengths to their highest levels of excellence and distinction. So question number five is, looking around you, what are you better at than other people? Of all the things you do, what are you better at? What are you really good at doing? Where do you make a significant contribution in your work? And where could you become better in order to make an even greater contribution to accelerate your career even faster? Now, number, number six is what we call your area of mastery. We have to ask yourself this. What is it that you can become really outstanding doing? One of the things we know is that high-performing men and women are very, very good at one or a few things, and they do more and more of those, and mastery, competence, leads to high productivity. What is a top priority with regard to the spending of your time? I'll tell you what it is. It's spending time becoming better at the things that are most important that you do. Spending time learning how to be really, really good at the critical things you do can lead to payoffs that are absolutely extraordinary. Remember, the top one or two or three percent earn five or 10 or 20 times the average because they're very, very good at a couple of things. So one of the ways that you set priorities, saying, what could I become really good at? Number, number seven is ask, what are your high value activities? What are your high value activities? What are the things that you and only you do in your area of operation, your work, your responsibilities, that really contribute high payoff to your company. Your high value activities are the answers to the question, why am I on the payroll? What have I been hired to accomplish? What are my key result areas? And here's an important point. Never give in to the temptation to do small things first. Never give in to the temptation to clear up little things when you still have valuable things to do. Number eight is how do you use the ABCDE system in order to dramatically increase your uh, ability to produce? Well, the ABCDE system, system is taught in all time management courses and basically says this, is that your A jobs are your must jobs. There's severe, serious negative consequences if you don't do these things. Your B tasks are your uh, should jobs. They're important, but the negative consequences for doing them uh, are not that serious. Your C jobs are the things that are nice to do. And we have a concept called completion by deletion. Completion by deletion means delete the things that are nice to do so you have more time to work on the A's and B's. The D tasks are the tasks that you delegate. And the E tasks are the tasks that you eliminate. Now, eliminating tasks is one of the fastest ways to increase your productivity. So you ask yourself, what are the things you can eliminate? What are the things you can delegate? What are the things you can delete? And you'll find that your A task will almost invariably account be the 20% of things that will account for 80% of what you do. Number nine, and this is the key question in time management. Always ask yourself, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? What is the most valuable use of your time right now? Most important question in time management. It keeps you on track, keeps you working steadily in the direction of your highest capability to perform. Keep asking, what's the most valuable use of my time right now? Then do only that thing. This brings us to priority setting idea number 10 is do the right things rather than doing things right. As we've said before, the very first thing and worst thing in the world is to do very well what need not be done at all. And if it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing right. So do the right things. How do you do the right things? You go through this process and you keep asking yourself, 
What are the things that I must do? What are the things that have the greatest possible consequences? What are the things that account for the 80% of the value of the things that I do? And do the right things rather than the fun things, the easy things, the convenient things. Key number 11 to setting priorities is to do first things first. And stay with those things until they're complete. Do first things first. And stay with those things until they're complete. Do first things first and second things <laughs> not at all. Now, the twelfth key to setting priorities is the quality of courage. The quality of courage is the indispensable quality of leadership, and it means to have the courage to put off doing the things that are of low contribution and focus your mind, your time, your attention on doing the things that make the greatest contribution. It takes a lot of courage to set priorities and to stick to it, but each time you do it develops the quality of courage. This leads us to number 13, which requires courage, and it is the establishment of posteriorities. You see, if you're going to set priorities, you also have to set posteriorities. The basic rule is this, is you can't start doing one thing unless you stop doing something else. What you have to do is you have to discard the past. You have to say, what are the things I'm going to stop doing? The people I'm going to stop associating with, the jobs I'm going to stop working on, and you have to establish them as posteriorities that may or may not have been relevant in the past, but which are not relevant to the future. They are not important in their consequences. Number 14 in setting priorities, always choose the future over the past. Always choose the future over the past. Always choose the opportunities of tomorrow rather than the problems of yesterday. Do you know that 80% of people spend their time working on solving the problems of yesterday or finding out who's to blame for them? When everything things go wrong, always ask yourself, where do we go from here? What is the future? What do we do tomorrow, the next day? How do we solve it? Keep yourself solution-oriented, future-oriented, rather than present and past-oriented. Fifteenth key to priorities is to focus on opportunities. Ask yourself, since you're going to have to live the rest of your life in the future, what are the opportunities of tomorrow? What are the things that you can do today that will lead to great payoffs in the future based on everything that you know. Think always in terms of future orientation. It's the hallmark of the superior thinker. Where do we go from here? What do we do from here? Now number 16 is to consider the futurity of all present events. The futurity of all present events. Futurity simply asks the question, what is the positive potential future impact of what I'm doing? In one of the most longitudinal studies on success, what they found was that men and women who were very successful had what they called long-time perspective. They found that cross-culturally, throughout all social, economics, and racial groups, people who had the longest time perspective were always the men and women who accomplished the most. Now, what did this mean? It meant that everything that they did on a day-to-day -day basis, they asked themselves, how is this likely to affect me one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years out? And the longer the time perspective, the more likely it was that those people would move up socioeconomically. They, always, they also found that people who had short time perspective, people who were only thinking about how these things would affect them today, people, if you like, were always looking for the things that were fun and easy rather than the things that were long term and required tremendous discipline but, and were hard but had long payoffs, the people who concentrated on the short term were always the least successful people. The people with the long time perspective were the most successful. Remember, success, by the way, is an attitude. And the critical attitude that you need to develop to be a great success in your life is to think in terms of the long term. Practice delayed gratification. Work hard today in order to enjoy the benefits tomorrow. And one of the ways of setting priorities is saying, what is the most important use of my time right now with regard to the long term and then do that. Number 17, remember this, there's always enough time to do the important things. We say there's never enough time to do it right, but there's always enough time to do it over. The fact is there's always enough time to do the important things. A person says, I don't have enough time, is a person who is really not thought. So ask yourself this question, what would you do with your time if you only had six months to live? What would you do with your time if you only had six months to live? You would find that, that your mind would become wondrously clear, as Samuel Johnson said, and it would be very clear to you what is really, really important. An exercise we put our people through in our seminars, we say, what would you do if you only had six weeks to live, or six days, or six hours, or 60 minutes? 
You see, when you begin to really look at your life, you'll find that there's always enough time to do the important things, but the critical thinking skill is to look at your work and do what Thomas J. Watson said, founder of IBM, think. Think about your work before you begin. Think about your work before you begin. Now, number 18 is to always be upgrading and downgrading your posteriorities and your priorities. You see, something which was very, very important to do today or yesterday may not be important tomorrow. So always be asking yourself, what are my priorities today? What were they yesterday? What need I do more of? What need I do less of? We have a natural tendency to do what is fun and to do what is easy. We have a natural tendency to do what is small and irrelevant because it's, uh, it's uh, enjoyable. But the key to success is to be upgrading some tasks and downgrading the others. And finally, number 19, a key question. We call it the one-month question. With regard to your work, ask yourself every single day before you begin this simple question. And the question is, if you were called away for an entire month and you had to leave tomorrow, what one thing would you get done before you left? Once you've written that down and thought about it, then ask yourself, if you had just enough time to do one more thing, what would it be? And then write down that. And if you do this, you'll be working on your top priorities all <laughs> said that action without thinking and planning is the cause of every failure. But the flip side of that is that action preceded by thinking and planning is the reason for every great success. Everything we've talked about up to now, preparing yourself mentally to be an excellent time manager, making the decision that that's what you're going to do, setting very clear goals and objectives and organizing them on the basis of priority, and then setting priorities and determining the activities you're going to engage in leads us to planning and organizing your time and your activities so that you can get the most done. And the starting point of time management is what is called the neatness habit. Now the neatness habit simply says that you can as much as double your productivity by increasing your level of neatness. That neatness means that you clean your workplace so that it is spotless and that all you have in front of you is one specific task when you begin work. In fact, there have been lots of studies done on the subject of neatness and over and over again, we come back to the fact that neatness gives you self-esteem. It gives you a feeling of personal pride. It makes you look effective. It makes people see you as effective. It improves your self-image and increases your output. So one of the questions you always want to ask yourself when you look at your workplace is, what kind of a person works at that workplace? If you look in your briefcase, you should ask yourself, what kind of a person owns that briefcase? Look at your car. What kind of a person drives that car? Because the things around you correspond exactly to the state of your mind. You know what we have found? Is that a cluttered desk equals a cluttered mind. A cluttered desk, a cluttered purse, a cluttered car equals a cluttered mind. So the starting point of planning and organizing is to get really neat. Neatness is the key. It's the core personal productivity habit. Now sometimes people say, ho, 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 they say, well, I know where everything is. Do you know what we have found? We have found that the person is spending so much of their mental capacity keeping what is lost organized and remembering where everything is that they don't have as much of their mental capacity available to do the work that they're paid for. And if they're productive working in a messy environment, they are much more productive than they would be working in a neat environment. Now here was the second point. Is in a recent study, 50 out of 52 senior executives said they would not promote a person with a messy desk or a messy work environment they said that they would not even give that person important responsibilities because they would not trust the person to do the job well. In fact, the tendency to work in a messy work environment can actually sabotage your profession because it holds you back from getting the opportunities that you need to be really successful. So, here is a rule. The rule in personal neatness is when you're done, put it away. Whenever you're done with anything, put it away. I have worked with Swiss chefs who've been trained in the Swiss uh, cooking school in Geneva, and one of the things that they do is before they cook, they bring out every single thing that they need, they use it, and they put every single thing away in sequence. When you work, you will find that good craftsmen 
really effective and efficient people do it and they put it away. We say to, we say to our children, complete your transactions. Whatever you start, finish and put it away. Our children, by the way, go to a school called Montessori. Montessori builds children so they come out with tremendous levels of self-esteem and self-confidence. And their key is this, is from the age of three, they have them engage in tasks where they start it, do it, and put it away. Start it and do it and put it away. Now, each time you finish a task and put it away, do you know what you feel like? You feel like a winner. When you feel like a winner, it excites you and enthuses you and wants you to, and gets you wanting to do even more. So putting your tasks away is a powerful way to pump up your own self-esteem. The rule is, when you've completed it, do it away. Put it away. Number four is, whatever task you're working on, handle it only once. Handle it only once. This is one of the most powerful of time management tools. It means if you're going to pick up a piece of paper of any kind, do something with it. If you cannot act on the piece of paper or complete it, at least do something with, with it which moves it along one stage in the work process. Many studies show that the average executive picks up an important piece of paper as many as five times before he or she acts on it. Do you know what that means? It means that you increase the amount of time necessary to deal with a piece of paper by as much as 500% by simply avoiding dealing with it when you pick it up the first time. So here's a very simple, powerful system that's been developed with regard to papers, and it's called the TRAF system. The TRAF system has four letters. T-R-A-F. T stands for toss. Put it in the wastebasket. Tossing is one of the most powerful things that you can do. Ask yourself, what would happen if I couldn't find this piece of paper again? Do I really need this piece of paper? Does it need to be filed? Am I going to examine it or read it? Do you know what one of the biggest problems in the American workplace is today? It's called pileitis. Pileitis means we keep piling up things that we think that we're going to read or use sometime and we never do. So use your wastebasket generously. Here's your basic rule. When in doubt, toss it out. Now, number three is refer. Refer it or delegate it to someone else. If it's not your job or you can give it to someone else or pass it on to someone else, by all means, pass it on to them rather than sitting and thinking about it yourself. Peter Drucker says that the average person has to delegate everything that is possible so that you'll have enough time to do the one or two things that make a big difference. The third letter is A is action. Now, if you're going to take action on it, have what is called an action file. An action file is, in my estimation, a red file. I use that. And these are things that you're going to work on, but perhaps you can't work on them now, so you move it along one step by putting it in your action file for work later. And the fourth step is file. Now here's the critical rule. Only 80% 80, 80 of everything that is filed is never used again. It's never called for again, and it's never required again. So again, ask yourself, before you assign that and create work for someone else in filing something, by all means say, I'm ever gonna need this again. If we're not gonna need it again, throw it away. Ask yourself another question. If we really needed this, it was a terrible emergency, could we get it back again? Could we call somebody, could we pick it up? And if you could, throw it away. 80% of what you file will never be seen again. Now, number uh, six in planning and organizing is preparation. Before you begin to work, have everything that you need. Have everything at hand. Again, look upon yourself as a craftsman or a craftswoman, and what you'll find is the very best workers prepare everything. They have their pens, their papers, their calculators, their details, their files. Everything they need is at hand so that they can sit down and they can work without giving, getting up. Your poor workers, by the way, are always having to get up and get something and come back, and get up and get something and come back, and then they get distracted, and then they get diverted, then they do something else, and they get very little done. Remember, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between what you produce, your outputs, and what you get paid, and how good you feel about yourself. So prepare everything before you begin. Now, the seventh key is have time management tools. Now, there are specific time management tools that everybody needs to have. The first time management tool is what is called a master list. Now, you can, you can create a master list just by buying a, um, a spiral notebook. You buy a spiral notebook and every single thing you can ever think to write, uh, to do, you write down in that spiral notebook and you keep this as a catch-all system so that when you, have, when you have other time, you take it out of the master list and you delegate it to specific days. The second thing that you need is a calendar. You need to be able to organize your time. And the third thing you need tied into the calendar and the master list is a daily list. Now your daily list is actually your 
blueprint for the day. Your daily list is what tells you what you're going to do from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, and your daily list is tied into your goals, to your major priorities, and is what you do your A, B, C, D, E's, and your 80, 20's on. So a daily list is the foundation or the blueprint for your productivity during the course of the day. Now here's the rule with regard to the daily list. First of all, never work without a daily list. Second of all, prepare your daily list the night before so that your subconscious can work on it the night before, during the night while you're asleep. Now the eighth key here is the 45 file system. So you'll never forget anything again. The 45 file system says get yourself 45 hanging files. The hanging files have 31 files which equal days of the month. The, they have uh, another 12 files which equal months of the year and there, and there is another two files which equal years. This equals a total of 45 files. Then what you do is you have something coming up in a few months, very simple, you simply stick it into that month. When that month comes, you take it and you divide it up into days. If it's two years ahead, you divide it into years and you'll never forget another task. Now, number nine, key to success is work nonstop. Once you get started, work nonstop. Put your head down and say, I will work now, and put your head down and keep on working until you get it done. You can set yourself, as we say, little rewards. Give yourself a reward for completing the task. Train yourself like a Pavlovian dog, and avoid the tendency, by the way, to fall into what is called Parkinson's Law, where that work expands to fill the time allotted for it. You concentrate on getting the work done in a smaller period of time, rather than allowing the work to expand like an accordion to fill the time that you have necessary. Number 10 key to planning and organizing. Remember that planning saves four, to four minutes for every one minute that you spend in planning. Very often people will say, well, I don't have time to plan. I really don't have the time to plan because I'm so busy. What we have found is that it's very hard to spend more than 10 or 12 minutes a day planning in advance, making out a list, organizing the list by priority, and organizing your workplace. But for every minute that you invest in planning, you'll save four in execution. Sometimes you'll save 10 or 20 or 30, but what this means is that you can get a 400% to 500% return on energy, return on your energy invested by planning. Number 13, number 11, I'm sorry, uh, use a uh, organized filing system. Now here's an interesting point. Many filing systems are so poor that it takes the average executive in the average company 30% of their time looking for lost files. 30% of the time in the average organization is spent looking for misplaced items that have been lost somewhere. So what you need is a filing system, and the simplest of all is an alphabetical, an ABC type of system, where every file is listed alphabetically, and second to that, you need a Rolodex. If you're at home, you need the same little system. You can buy a Rolodex in any stationary store, and what this does, it shows you alphabetically where each file is. So therefore, when you create a file, you create a card in your Rolodex that tells you where you can find the file. The basic rule is the rule of five. It says that you should be able to retrieve any uh, file in your office, any piece of paper within five minutes, or you are suffering from malorganization. Number 12 is what is called prime time. Now, one of the keys to planning and organizing is prime time, and there's two types. There's both internal prime time and there's external prime time. Internal prime time is when you are at your best. Organize the most important things that you have to do in the course of a day when you feel the best, usually in the morning. But some people are best in the afternoon, some people are best in the evening. Some people work at the very best first thing in the morning at 5 or 6 a.m. So what is your internal prime time where you are the most productive? Second of all, ask what is the external prime time? This is where your customers, where your boss, where your staff are most accessible and available. If you're in sales, your external prime time is when you can see your customers. If you are in any particular profession where your customers are accustomed to seeing you at a certain time, this is your external prime time that you need to plan and organize your life around. But see if you can't coordinate both your internal and your external prime time. Number 13 idea is what is called your to-do list. Now we talked about the daily list and this is just a slight expansion on it, but what it says is this is that people who work from lists are 25% more productive than people who do not work from lists. Never do anything without writing it down on your to-do list. If you're going to go shopping, make a list. If you're going to go to the office, make a list. 
the most productive time managers in America are inveterate list makers. Make it to the point where people make fun of you, but always be working from a to-do list. Never start work, even on your action file or anything else, without making a list first, organizing the list, and starting on the most important item in the list. Number 14 idea is what is called the 30% rule. The 30% rule is always allow yourself 30% more time than you expect for any task. You'll find that very productive people are not pe people who are in a panic or working very hard. They are people who have allowed themselves enough time to do the job and to do it right. Never plan your appointments back to back one after another. Take, MS, estimate how much time it will take you and then give yourself 30% more. You'll be amazed at how much more productive you are. Number 15, remember this, is that planning reduces stress. One of the greatest problems that we have in the workplace today is stress, and the primary reason is because we feel out of control of our work and out of control of our environment. Remember, the very best way to get yourself into control is to plan and organize your work in advance. The most effective and productive people are those who have the very best plans and are working the plans. And finally, number 18, remember this, practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. That even if you're not a particularly good planner now, Planning is a skill that is very simple. It's sort of like a bicycle. Riding a bicycle or typing with a typewriter, you can make the decision if you desire. Remember the four Ds. If you really want it, if you make the decision, if you discipline yourself, and if you're determined enough, you can become absolutely excellent at practice, absolutely excellent at planning and organizing, and you can so dramatically increase your productivity and performance that today you cannot even imagine it. Give it a try. If you really want to be successful, if you really want to go all the way to the top in your profession, then you need to develop the ability to get results. In every single study of high-performing men and women, we find that intense result orientation goes hand in hand with big payoffs in life. You see, it's not how much time you put in or the activities that you engage in or how sincere or how intelligent or competent or capable or anything else. It's only what you produce, the results that you get from the time that you put in that counts in determining your rewards, not only your uh, psychic rewards, how good you feel about yourself, but your financial rewards. You're always paid in direct proportion to the quality and the quantity of the results that you produce. So let's start off talking about getting things done with point number one. Point number one is that your rewards in life will always equal your results. As we call this the law of sowing and reaping, the law of cause and effect, that the cause of everything that happens to you is your ability to get results, and these are your rewards. If you want to increase the quality and quantity of your rewards, you have to think all the time about increasing the quality and quantity of your results. Now, the second point is this, is that most people are very unproductive. Most people could not do a full day's work if their life depended upon it. In fact, every study that I've ever seen suggests that the average person works at only 50% of capacity. In fact, in most work environments, about 30% of all the work time is spent in socializing, gossiping, wasting time, talking, chit-chatting, hanging around the water fountain, reading the newspaper, drinking coffee, and so on. What does it mean to you? It means that the average person is working at 50% or less of capacity. There are tremendous opportunities for you if you'll do some of the things that we talk about to rapidly move ahead of other people. Now, the third key, and we talked about it last time, is that the starting point of high productivity, the starting point of getting things done is the quality of neatness. The quality of neatness means that you start with a clean desk and you end with a clean desk. You start with a clean briefcase and you end with a clean briefcase. You take the time to make sure that your entire working environment looks neat and professional and productive and effective. Remember this, it's not just what you do, but it's the perception of other people of what you do that counts. I read a story by a self-made millionaire who said that he built five successful companies and one of their critical rules was that every single person kept a clean desk. Now the fourth key in getting things done is the importance of focus. Focus which leads to clarity. 
Now, we talk about this over and over again. Focus means that you're absolutely clear about what you're trying to accomplish. Focus means that you're absolutely clear about your key result areas and why you're on the payroll. We say that fuzzy focus leads to fuzzy results. Clear focus leads to clear results. And this means that you take the time to think. You take the time to think through, why am I on the payroll? What have I been hired to accomplish? What are my key result areas? What are my core functions? What are the 20% of the things that I do that account for 80% of my results? And so on. So the starting point in getting things done is focus and clarity. I call this the, it's like adjusting the camera all the time. So you keep your focus very, very clear. The fifth key to high productivity is concentration. Now concentration is, in reality, where all the work in time management leads us to. It is the ability to concentrate 100% on one thing, setting priorities, the most important thing, and to stay with that single task until it's finished. Concentration means moving forward in a straight line toward the goals and objectives that you've clearly identified. It means concentrating without diversion or distraction. Focus and concentration. I believe in 25 years of research that the reasons for success and happiness in life are focus and concentration. The reasons for uh, lack of success and unhappiness are lack of focus, lack of concentration. Which brings us to number six, and that is task completion. Now, what we know about task completion is that not only is it the key to the future, not only is it the key to getting more and greater and better opportunities, but important task completion, doing something that's important to you and carrying it through and finishing it 100% at the end is a source of energy, enthusiasm, and high self-esteem. Men and women who are working consistently on getting important things done and staying with it till they're complete are more positive, they're more optimistic, they're more self-confidence, for confident, they have more belief in, in, in self-assurance in themselves, and they get more opportunities to complete more tasks. And here's the flip side. Is completing low-priority tasks leads to stress. If you work and you get a lot of little things done, but they're not moving you toward the accomplishment of things that are really important to you, what happens is you just feel crummy as a result. So this brings us to number seven. Number seven is the quality of perseverance. You need to persevere and persist single-mindedly toward the completion of your important task because we say that the ability to concentrate is a discipline and perseverance or persistence is self-discipline in action. You see, anybody can start off to do a job, but your ability to keep in there and keep slogging and stay with it and refuse to budge and keep moving is the critical factor of high performance. Principle number eight in getting things done is remember that the average person, especially executives, pick up an important piece of paper or task as many as five times before they actually complete work on the task. What does this mean? It means that if you pick up the task and you focus single-mindedly on that and it's your most important and you concentrate on it till it's complete, you can give yourself a 500% savings in time or increase in productivity. This has been proven in study after study after study that the fastest way to increase your output is to pick up a task and to stay with that task instead of picking it up and coming back and picking it up and coming back and so on. Number nine is the importance of developing a compulsion to closure. A compulsion to closure is a commitment before you begin that I will stay with this task until it's finished. You will put your head down and you will hammer and hammer and hammer until it's finished. And one of the ways to do this is to train yourself with a series of rewards. What we found over and over again is that really high-performing high men and women are those who are capable of establishing a series of rewards for each milestone in the completion of a major task. And what they do is they trigger a conditioned response, almost like Pavlo's dog, where they uh, fed them a piece of meat and the dog salivated and they rang a bell at the same time. And if they repeated this often enough, pretty soon when they rang the bell, the dog salivated. If you continue to set up a reward structure for yourself for the completion of small and large tasks, you know what happens? Is that you eventually salivate and get excited, motivated, and enthused when you're working on something that's important. Now, number 10 is to develop what is called a, an affirmation or a mental trick to keep yourself working. And the most powerful of all are the words, back to work. Whenever you find your attention drifting, Say to yourself very strongly, back to work, back to work. Somebody comes in and wants to talk to you, you say to that person, I'm sorry, but I have to get back to work. 
and your boss comes in, you say, boss, I'd like to spend a lot of time talking, but I have to get back to work. Get to be known as the person, little Mr. or Mrs. Back to Work. Because the thing is, when you keep repeating back to work, back to work, back to work, you program those words into your subconscious mind, and they actually activate and push you forward and get you back into the job rather than diverting your attention to doing something that's fun and easy. Now, the 11th key to getting things done is terribly important. It's called chunks of time. Is to do important tasks, especially the important tasks which are not particularly urgent, the tasks that can contribute the very most to your long-term future, you need chunks of unbroken, sustained time. Any decision involving other people requires a lot of time in thought and discussion. Any proposal, any report, learning, any critical subject, gathering information requires chunks of time, minimum of 60 to 90 minute chunks of time. Now, successful men and women are those who structure their days so that they get these chunks of time. And in, in, in my experience, let me give you four ideas that you can use. Number one is come in uh, early in the morning, or uh, number two is to stay at home early in the morning. Get up at five or six and work for uh, an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Come in early before anybody else. Uh, work at lunchtime. When everybody goes out for lunch, the office becomes quiet, close your door, put your head down, and work. People in my office and people in other offices will often take do not disturb signs and hang them on the wall or hang them on their doors, and what they will say is do not disturb, and they'll take a quiet time of an hour to two hours in the morning and perhaps also in the afternoon. The next, or probably the fifth chunk of time that you can get is stay after work and work for a couple of hours. Remember, one unbroken hour is worth three hours in a work environment with interruptions. So if you can break yourself one hour chunks here and there, you can dramatically increase your productivity. Number 12, develop the body language of high productivity. What we have found is that there is a certain physiology. In other words, if you sit up straight and erect and strong and clear-eyed and move forward on your chair and sit up to your desk with your back straight, it's very hard not to be productive. But if you lean back, if you slump down, if you put up your feet, you find your whole body relaxing too. So develop and maintain the body language or physiology of high performance. Number 13 key to getting things done is called single handling. Now single handling is probably one of the most important time management techniques ever developed. It simply says that when you pick up a task, don't pick it up unless you're ready to stay with it and to work on it until it's finished. And once you pick it up, discipline yourself, force yourself to stay at that task and stay at that task and keep at it until the task is done. In fact, the studies show that you will increase your overall output and productivity by 50% the very day that you begin adamantly single handling every single task. Single handling comes from s several studies. It is the ultimate expression of concentration in work and it's absolutely outstanding. Number 14 is concentrate on those areas where superior performance will bring outstanding results. Concentrate on those areas where superior performance will bring outstanding results. Concentrate on those areas where you can really make a difference. Ask yourself this question, what can I, and only I do, that if done really well, will make an extraordinary contribution? Ask yourself, what can I, and only I do, that if done really well, will make an extraordinary contribution to my work, to my life, to my company, to my health, to my happiness, to my future? to my finances, but always concentrate on the one or two small areas where if you do a terrific job, it makes a tremendous difference. We say in marketing, fish for whales. If you're in marketing or sales, ask yourself, what customers, if we could get them, what sales, if we could get them, would make an extraordinary difference to the success of our company? And concentrate on the whales, the areas of greatest opportunity and possibility in your work and personal life. The 15th key is concentration of power. Now, concentration of power is an expression that comes from uh, military terms, and it also comes from time management. It's also called the principle of the mass. And what it says is that you take all of your resources, and you put all your resources together, and you concentrate them single-mindedly on, on a single point. In fact, you'll find that every extraordinary achievement in the history of mankind has come about as the result of an individual or group of individuals being able to concentrate their powers into the critical point, the critical point where, where that makes all the difference. So concentration of power is a habit of mind. Where and in what way can you concentrate your power to achieve the very most? 
Number 16 is always concentrate on strengths. According to Peter Drucker's work on effectiveness, one of the top five management techniques for effectiveness is to concentrate on strengths rather than on weaknesses. Now here's an important point, is you have, as an individual, specific strengths and potentials that if you develop them to their full extent, you can accomplish anything you want in life. You also have a lot of weaknesses. People are pits, mountains and valleys. People have a lot of weaknesses where there are things that they can't do particularly well. They also have peaks where there are things that they do extraordinarily well. So your first job is to look at yourself and say, what are my particular strengths? What are the strengths that I have where I can make the most significant contribution to my life? Then you ask, where can I make the most significant contribution to my company? Where can I make the most significant contribution to my family and to my long-term future? Then you say, what are the significant opportunities in my work environment? What are the significant opportunities for increasing revenues and decreasing costs? What are the significant strengths of other people? And how could those people be deployed usefully? There's a basic rule that says that um, a weakness is merely a strength inappropriately applied. And very often, you're applying your strengths inappropriately, too. Number 17 is set deadlines on everything that you have to do. Use deadlines as a forcing system. A forcing system is a way to push you from behind and internally to get the job done. And number 18 is to promise others. One of the ways that you can motivate yourself to concentrate single-mindedly on one thing at a time is once you've decided to do an important project and you've decided it's the most important of all projects, then write it down, make a plan for its accomplishment, and then promise the significant people in your life that you will have this job done on time by a certain day. You see, when you promise someone else, it sort of programs you subconsciously and impels you forward and makes you much more likely to concentrate and focus and become intensely result-oriented in everything you do. The more experienced you become in your job, and the more effective you become at time management, the more likely it is that you're going to be assigned multi-task projects. You're going to be assigned to do things that have a multiple or a variety of tasks involved, and your ability to organize these jobs and to do them well is going to be a critical factor in your success. In fact, a study at Stanford University that studied the qualities and characteristics of men and women who moved up into the upper echelons of management found that the number one most identifiable and measurable quality was the ability to bring together a team of people and to work with that team in cooperation to complete a complex task. And everywhere around you, you'll find that the men and women who are at the top of their fields are those who, in most cases, who have developed the ability to assemble a team, to work as part of a team, and to channel that team's energies and abilities toward completing a task or a project on time. Now, when we talked a little bit earlier, we talked about the importance of time management, about the importance of setting goals, and the importance of setting priorities, and the importance of getting yourself organized and getting things done. Now, this all comes together in the multitask job. Look around you and ask, what are the multitask jobs that you engage in? Even something like planning a party is a multitask job. Producing a newsletter is a multitask job. Making a decision on a new piece of equipment might be a multitask job. So you will find yourself surrounded by multitask jobs, and the importance of your work is determined by the number of multitask jobs you do. One of my favorite lines is the line from the Bible that says, Oh, good and faithful servant, you have been made, you have been master over small things, I will make you master over large things. What this means in the world of work is that if you become a master over complex tasks, you're going to become, have an opportunity to work with much more complex tasks and be paid much more for it. Now, the second key is that planning and organizing skills are the core skills of success in management. The ability to plan and organize your own work, then to plan and organize the work of one more and two more and several other people is absolutely essential to your success. And your ability to plan and organize effectively and well all comes to bear 
in these complex tasks. So here's how you perform a complex task. Here are the basic rules. Number one, define the ideal results. Define the ideal results. Ask yourself, if we performed this task to distinction, what would the result look like? What would the result accomplish? What would the result achieve? And define the ideal results, point of view of the person or persons who have to use what this team produces. If you're producing a product, say, what would our customers say if we produce the perfect product? If you're putting together any kind of a strategy, just always say, what would be the ideal results? And here's the key. Start with the goal and work back. Start with the goal and work back. This has been the key to successful business building and project management for years. Define the goal and work back from the goal to the present time. Well, point number four is to set a deadline. Once you've determined exactly what the ideal project will look like, set a deadline and determine the date upon which the project will be complete. One of the things that I suggest, by the way, is building a fudge factor. If the project is important, and the more important it is, the more important it is that you build in fudge or extra time to provide for unexpected exigencies. Number five, once you've set a date and a deadline and you define the goal, make a complete list of everything that has to be done, every single activity that has to be completed in order to complete the job. Start with the very last thing that will happen just before the job is done. What's the second to the last thing? What's the third to the last thing? And work all the way back to the present day to work out a complete list of every single activity so that you have a roadmap. When this roadmap is complete, the job will be done in its entirety. Number six is ask yourself, what additional information will you require? What is it that you don't know right now? And make getting that information a task. Put it down as a task as one of the things that has to be done. Also, when you put it down as a task, you will assign a timeline to that task, and you will design your entire project so that getting that piece of information becomes a critical part of it. Number seven is determine your limiting step. Now, the limiting step concept we talked about a little bit earlier. I want to talk about it again. It's called your choke point. The choke point has one simple definition. It determines the speed at which you get from where you are to where you want to go. So ask yourself, what is the limiting step that determines the speed at which we complete this project? What is the limiting step that determines how fast we get from where we are to where we want to go? What part of the project takes the longest? Very often, the part of the project that takes the longest becomes the determining factor in how long it will take to finish the whole project. So ask yourself, what is our limiting step? And then ask yourself, what can we do to alleviate this limiting step? Is there anything that we can do to speed things up? Very often, you will find shortcuts, you will find time-saving devices, you will find established methods and principles, and so on, but the limiting step becomes the critical factor, not only in determining the deadline, but in, in determining how capable and competent you appear to others when it comes time to saying that we'll have this job done by a certain time. You can't go back and say, Afterwards, well, I didn't know it would take this long because, uh, unfortunately, you just look foolish. All right, number eight. There are two ways to organize a multitask project. The first way to organize the project is what is called sequential, the sequential way. Now, the sequential way is when there are several jobs within the multitask uh, project that can be done in order. Uh, first one can be done, and then the second can be done, and the third can be done, so that each of them are sequential, but each of them requires uh, that the previous one be done first. Uh, for instance, someone has to write something, someone has to edit it, someone has to uh, typeset it, someone has to do layout with it, uh, and so on. So therefore, the writing would come first, then the editing, uh, and then the typesetting, then the layout, and so on. Now, the other way that you can organize a project is parallel. There are many tasks that can be done at the same time. There are many tasks where you can begin working on one part, someone else can begin working on another, and you can work on several tasks on a parallel basis. Let me give you a very simple example of a project management chart. Very important way of thinking. Across the top of every project management chart is time. Now, the time may be days, the time may be weeks, months, years, it doesn't matter. Down the side, you have tasks. Now, these are the things that have to be done. So what you do is you lay them out in a chart like this, and let's say you lay it out over a period of four months. And here you have four months, and the months are January, February, March, and April. 
you have worked back and determined that it takes you four months to do the job. So here you have completion. Completion is at this point. You then work the task back, and you can find that these are the different things that have to be done over the course of this particular task. When this is done, this can be done at the same time. When this is this way far along, this can begin. These two can work parallel. Some cannot be started until others are done, and so on. But by laying it out like this, suddenly you have a perfect picture of what is necessary to be effective in completing this task. Now, the tenth critical point, once you have this organization chart, is to assign and delegate. Assign and delegate, which means that you take your, bring your team together, and the very best way to do this is through discussion and dialogue, talking about what needs to be done, dividing it up, have people take different parts of the task, but assign every single one of the individual parts of the task that need to be done, and delegate it, and delegate every single one with a deadline. And your deadline is for completion, and your deadline always contains a fudge factor. When you assign and delegate parts of the task, build in what is called a review process. That means time and place where you will check and see how well they're doing. It may be once a week, it may be every Wednesday, it may be every two weeks, but a review process, process is absolutely essential. If the project is worth doing, it's worth reviewing on a regular basis. Number 12, the key to successful project management, and many people say that this is the crux of it, is ask yourself, what could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? What are all the things that can possibly go wrong? Now, here's where you have to take into consideration Murphy's Laws. There are five Murphy's Laws. You're familiar with the first two. The first of Murphy's Law says that whatever can possibly go wrong will go wrong, and that will be true in a project. The second is that of all the things that can possibly go wrong, the worst possible thing will go wrong. So you ask, what's the worst possible thing that can go wrong here? The third of Murphy's Law says no matter how much time you allocate, it takes longer than you plan. The fourth is no matter how much money you allocate, it costs more than you expected. And the fifth of Murphy's Laws is before you do anything, you have to do something else first. So take those five laws into consideration when planning and never expect to violate the laws because that will just lead to foolishness and embarrassment. Remember, your success is determined by how well you do these projects. Number 13 is ask yourself, what are all the problems that you're likely to have in the course of putting this program together? Engage in what is called crisis anticipation. Crisis anticipation is something that project leaders and, and successful uh, executives always do, and they say, what are all the crises or unexpected reverses that could occur, and then have a plan B. A plan B is an alternative plan that you have to fall back on in the likelihood that your worst possible things could possibly happen. Always be ready with a plan B. The most successful men and women alive are those who have already developed an alternative before the uh, rubber hits the road, before the uh, vehicle hits the wall, if you like. Number 14 is use what is called a storyboard. Now, a storyboard is a visual representation of a particular project that was developed by the Walt Disney Corporation, and it's absolutely an outstanding way of increasing your effectiveness. Take a large board. You can use a cork board. You can use a visual board. What I have found is you can now use stick-on notes as part of storyboarding, and take what is called and put a header, and the header is the name of the project. Below the header have subheads, and each of these subheads is a part of the project. You can have as many as you need, but below each of the subheads, there is a task, and there's a series of cards underneath here. Now, sometimes these tasks can be in different colors so that they can be assigned to different people, and what you do is you then put pictures up here, and these pictures or these numbers or these tasks can then be moved around. They can be moved around so that you have more under one or you have larger ones under another, but you have a visual picture of how the project goes together. Sometimes you can have a storyboard that shows them in sequence, and these will be timed sequence. These may be months. These may be people. Uh, these may be particular project areas. But storyboarding is a very powerful way for everybody to get a visual picture of what you're trying to accomplish and then to contribute ideas to this visual picture. Now, the 14th key... With re I'm sorry, the 15th key with regard to project management is the type of problems that are likely to occur. The first problem is expecting everything to go well. Expecting everything to go well and not expecting there to be any problems. 
And we find that the very best people are the ones who are always aware that they're like they have difficulties. The 16th is trying to do too much at once, trying to hurry, trying to do too much at once because you fall behind. The third key that you have is, um, is not allowing enough time to complete the project because you didn't realize that it would take that much. Now finally, the last key, and it's one of the most important rules of time management, I call it Tracy's Law. Now Tracy's Law, it's because nobody's ever seen this but me. And Tracy's Law says that the difficulties of performing any task increase with the square of the number of steps in the task. By difficulties, I mean the cost or the potential cost, the potential problems, and the potential time involved. Let me give you an example. If a person is going to do a single task that is just one step, you are going to pick up the telephone and call. All right, that has a square of one, which means, let's put this down here, one square of one. This means that the square of one is one, the simplicity of the task is at a level of one, or what we call the complexity. It's Tracy's law of complexity. Now, if there are two steps to it, then you have two steps, but it's two steps squared. So now the level of complexity, which means the potential cost, potential problems, and potential time involved, goes to four. If there are three steps involved, three steps squared will be nine. So the potential complexity, or the length of time, the potential cost, the potential problems, it doesn't mean that they will all occur. It means that the potential for them goes up with the square of the number of steps. And if you go to four steps, and that's squared, it's 16. If you go to five steps and that's squared, it's 25. Now, what does this mean? It means that if you can simplify by going from five steps to four, you reduce the complexity from 25 to 16, which is almost 50%. So it's an, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary difference. Always, always, always in large products, projects, simplify, simplify, simplify. Simplification is the hallmark of the superior human being, of the superior executive. Let me just end with this one critical point, and it's this, is that your ability to manage multitask projects is the core skill where the essence of everything that you know and all your abilities come together. Your intelligence, your planning ability, your organizing ability, your personality, your knowledge of your field, everything comes together in managing multitask complex, and the more and the better you do of it, not only the more results you'll get, the more money you make, the happier you'll be, but the more successful you'll be in every single part of your life. I said before that one of Murphy's laws was before you do anything, you have to do something else first. And before you achieve maximum productivity, you have to eliminate the time wasters in your life. The time wasters surround you on all sides and tear away at your minutes and hours and hold you back from producing the critical results that are vital to the success in your career. We've been talking, by the way, about eliminating time wasters from the very beginning. In a way, we've told you about two laws. One is called the law of the excluded alternative which says that whenever you do one thing, you cannot simultaneously do another. So if you start to work on something that's more important to you, you cannot work on things that are less important. There's another law. It's called the law of forced efficiency. And again, it says when you have a burning desire to produce or perform in a particular area, and you focus all of your time, attention, and energy in that area, that alone will cause you to avoid and ignore and get away from the critical time wasters. So what we started with were the starting points of great success. And the first is clarity, clarity, clarity. What are you trying to do? How are you trying to do it? What are you trying to do? How are you trying to do it? Clarity is the number one word in time management, and it runs through everything you do. And it leads us to not only clarity with regard to goals and objectives, but it leads to us to clarity with regard to priorities, the 80-20 rule. What are the 20% of the things that you do that account for 80% of your results? And the more you can focus single-mindedly on those, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to avoid the time wasters. Now, the second key to avoiding time wasters is decision. Decision with regard to the areas of concentration. 
what are the one or few th two things that you're going to do that make all the difference? You see, you can never do everything there is to do, so you have to think, and you can only do the one or two things that make all the difference in the world, and that's decision with regard to concentration. And the more clear your decisions, and the more you concentrate, the easier it is for you to eliminate time wasters. Point number three is that you and I and everybody are surrounded by time wasters. In fact, most people are time wasters. Most people, by their very nature, because they're not as focused as you and I are, have a tendency to waste time. They socialize, they talk, they drink coffee, they drop in. They uh, phone us on the telephone, they have recurring crises, they have problems, they have uh, an excess of meetings and a whole lot of other things. So remember that most people waste time. Your job is to break away from others and be known to the critical people in your business as the person who doesn't waste time. Here's one of the great rules, is when you work, work all the time you work. Work all the time you work. Work all the time you work. This is one of the great rules of life. From the time that you come in, remember, your job is not to read papers, make phone calls, socialize, drop off your laundry, pick up your groceries, or get your dry cleaning done. Your job is to work all the time you work. If you're going to work eight hours, boy gum, you work eight solid hours and just work, work, work. And I promise you this, everybody that counts knows who the workers are, and everybody knows who the non-workers are. All right, looking at all the studies, we have found that there are several major time wasters in the world of work. And let's take them one at a time from the most prevalent. We'll talk about the basic seven. The first of the major time wasters is the telephone. The telephone seems to have an insistence with its ringing that causes us to be distracted over and over again. So here are some keys with regard to using the telephone. I'll just give them to you quickly. Key number one is have your calls held. Rather than responding to the telephone every time it rings, have your calls held. A second thing is to have your calls screened. If it is not important for you to talk to that person or there's no value to it, don't take the phone call. Don't allow your curiosity to overwhelm you. Number three is look upon the telephone as a business tool, not a social tool. You and I are conditioned from infancy, and especially from our teenage years, to think of the telephone as a social tool. We think that's how we communicate with, with, with our friends. The fact is that when you get into the business world, it's a business tool, which means get on and off it fast. Make it a business tool. When somebody phones, say, hello, how are you? And if they go into a conversation, say, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And get the conversation straight down to business as fast as possible. Now, here's another thing. When you're phoning somebody else, always have an agenda. Take a couple of seconds to write out what you're going to talk to the person about. And when you call them up, say, I'd like to talk to you about three things. And tell them what the agenda is. And when you discuss the three things, keep notes. We say the power is on the side of the person with the best notes. So keep notes on the conversation. And when you're finished with them, say, I know you're busy. I'll let you go. When a person is really conversational, likes to talk a lot, say, well, I certainly have enjoyed talking to you, and I know you're busy, so I'll let you go. Nobody's going to say, no, I'm not busy. So therefore, get on and off quickly. And finally, number five is batch your calls. So once you have collected all of these calls, return all your calls at the same time. There are very few calls that are so important that you can't put them off till later. Now, the second key source of, uh, of interruptions is visitors. We'll put the number four up here. Number five is visitors. Drop-in visitors, people who visit you either inside or outside the company without warning, and there are ways to take care of the visitors. Number one way to take care of the visitors, when somebody drops in and says, have you got a minute? What you say is no. And what you do say is very simply this, is say, no, I'm really busy right now. Could I talk to you a little bit later? Just be really polite, but pull a plug on a drop-in visitor as quickly as you possibly can. When somebody comes into your office, here's a quick key. Stand up. If you stand up, it's very hard for another person to sit down. It's almost impossible, in fact. So you stand up and you say, I'm really under the gun right now. I'm trying to finish a couple of things, and uh, can I talk to you a little bit later? What will happen is the person will stand up for a couple of minutes, they'll be a little bit uncomfortable, and then they'll leave. Now, a second thing that people do is that they put a do not disturb sign on their office, on, on their office handle. They get one from a hotel the next time they're in a hotel, and they put it on the outside so they can get themselves an hour or two hours of quiet time during the day. A third thing that you can do is when a visitor comes in is walk the, walk the visitor to the door. Say, well, one more thing before you go. And get up and take the visitor and walk them to the door. 
something that people often do, by the way, is they say, hey, have I shown you something? And they say, I want something I wanted to show you. And you get up, and you pick them, take them by the arm, and you take them outside of your office to show them something, and you say, I know you're busy. I'll let you get back to work. I'm in a hurry, too, and get back to work. So dealing with the drop-in visitor is absolutely essential. Standing up is one of the great keys. If you stand up quickly when somebody comes in, they're unlikely to stay there for very long. The sixth major source of interruptions is meetings. Now here's a couple of points with regard to meetings. First of all, meetings are absolutely essential in business. They are a business tool. They're an absolutely essential way of sharing information, solving problems, doing joint problem solving, and so on. Also team building. However, an excess of meetings indicates malorganization. What does that mean? It means that nobody is really sure what they're supposed to be doing, and there's probably too many people. So meetings are a great waste of time. The average person set, spends about three to five years of their life in meetings, and about 50 to 70 percent of that time is wasted. So how do you cut down on the amount of time that you waste in meetings? Here's the keys that have been discovered over and over again. First of all, don't go. If you can possibly get out of a meeting, don't go to it. Say, is it necessary for me to be at this meeting? Now, if you're holding a meeting, here's a critical point. Take the number of people who will be attending, multiply their hourly wage by the number of people to work out the cost of that meeting. If you have 10 people who are earning $25 an hour each, you have a meeting that costs $250 an hour. If somebody said, came to you and said, could I spend $250, what would you say? You'd say, wait a minute, what's the reason for this meeting? What's the purpose? Why are we going to spend $250? And you need to know the purpose of every meeting. So therefore, once you've determined the purpose of the meeting, be sure that you have an agenda. If you are not organizing the meeting, make sure that somebody else who is organizing has an agenda. The fourth thing that you can do to make meetings more effective is to have start and stop time and stay on schedule. If the meeting is supposed to go from 8.30 to 9.30, make sure it goes from 8.30 to 9.30. E, assume the latecomer is not coming. Don't wait for anybody. Just plunge right into the meeting. F is start with the most important items first on the agenda. Start with the most important items and deal with them first so that if the meeting runs out of time, you've at least covered the major things. G is leave as soon as possible. Ask if your item can be discussed or the thing that's of relevance to you can be discussed, and then when it's over, leave as quickly as possible. And finally, the last is if you're going to have a meeting, distribute minutes after the meeting so that everybody knows what happens. Distribute minutes and especially get closure on every item before you go on to additional items. And distribute minutes so that everybody knows what was decided. These are the keys to making meetings effective. The seventh major time waster in the world of work is firefighting. Now, why does firefighting arise? Well, firefighting arises one, in one case naturally. You can't avoid it. Unexpected crises occur. However, the best way to deal with a crisis is to anticipate it. Now, here's the rule. If the same crisis anticipate, arises more than once, the reason that has happened is because nobody has thought about how to put into place a policy that deals with it. So the first thing in dealing with a crisis, A, is to stop and think. Before you react, stop and think. Get the facts. Get the facts. Ask questions. What exactly happened? When did it happen? Where did it happen? How did it happen? Get the real facts, not the assumed facts or the apparent facts or the obvious facts, but get the real facts. Get the facts, and the more slowly you go toward thinking through the crisis, the more likely it is that your response to it will be effective. C is delegate wherever possible. If you can delegate resolving the crisis to someone else, by all means do so. Big mistake. If you come up through the ranks, and one of the things you do is you come up as you deal with this type of problem, when you rise to higher positions, you'll have a tendency to fall back into your comfort zone and go back and try to deal with the problem. So firefighting, uh, and firefighting is a natural tendency for us because it's comfortable, so delegate. Uh, and finally, the last key to, fire, to, to delegation is decisiveness. Whatever you do, make a decision. Make a decision and then get on with it. Which brings us to the eighth reason for uh, time wastage in organizations, and it's socializing. And as we said before, the average person spends as much as 30% of their time socializing. The fact is that socializing is a great waste of time. So what you simply ask is this. Is this what I've been hired to do? Not only is this what I've been hired to do, would I pay someone else to do what I'm doing? 
And remember, work all the time you work. Treat the working environment like a business environment and get away from socializing. Save your socializing for after work activities. Number nine is indecision. Indecision is almost invariably caused by either ignorance or fear. And one of the things we know about this indecision is that 80% of all decisions should be made now. One question you always have to ask yourself is, is this a decision that has to be made by me? And if it's not, delegate the decision. If possible, make the decision quickly. And we say that successful people are not necessarily those who make the right decisions, but they make their decisions right. In any case, indecision drags out time more than you can possibly imagine. Number 10 has to do with knowledge workers. The fact of the matter is, today, most of our employees are knowledge workers. Knowledge workers are people whose work is characterized by producing results. They produce results. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of unbroken time to converse with knowledge workers to, get, to help them articulate, to help them think, to dialogue, and so on. So you cannot rush dealing with knowledge workers. Critical point. Number 11, you have to ask yourself, whose time do you waste? Whose time do you waste? Because you are also a time waster for other people. Do you keep people waiting? Do you keep people uh, delayed? Do you come late for meetings? Do you promise things and then not do it? So ask other people, how do I waste your time and then do everything possible to eliminate it? The 12th form of time wasting is perfectionism. Is trying too hard to do the job too well the first time. So ask yourself, how well does a job have to be, to be done? And if you can do it that well, then don't worry about getting it right. Internal memos, things for internal distribution, don't have to be done perfectly every time. Number 13 major time waster is television. Now, the average adult in America wastes 25% of their time, their discretionary time, watching television. The average adult in America could become rich if all they did was not waste their time on television. Now, the way that you deal with television is to, first of all, understand that excessive television watching, now, not watching a learning program like this on video, but excessive television watching is very hurtful. It causes you to become passive. It turns your mind to porridge. It causes you to become apathetic. It causes you to lose your capacity to think critically. And what it does is it causes you to lose your aggressiveness. So here's the key to television. Cut down by one half hour per week. Chief executive officers of Fortune 500 corporations watch less than five hours of television per week. And there's a direct correlation between the number of hours of television you watch and how far down you go on the wage scale. The people who watch the least amount of television and spend the most amount of time reading, learning, communicating, growing, working at their work are the ones who are the most successful. And finally, number 14 is non-goal-oriented activity. The key to eliminating the time wasters and the interrupters is very simple is do not do anything that does not move you toward the accomplishment of goals that are important to you. Every single time an activity comes up, you have to ask yourself, is this moving me in the direction that I want to go? Is this helping me achieve a goal that's important to me? And if it's not, just say no. Procrastination is the enemy. Procrastination is your enemy. Procrastination is my enemy. Pro procrastination is not only the thief of time, it's the thief of money, it's the thief of life, it's the thief of success, it's the thief of happiness, it's the thief of self-esteem and high achievement. Procrastination is something that you need to go to work to strategically, step by step, eliminate as a part of your life. And in this session, <laughs> I'm going to tell you how to do it. The wonderful thing about procrastination, if there's anything good, is that when you eliminate procrastination, you have the key uh, to success. Let's start off with that point. Number one, the elimination of procrastination is the key to success. In fact, you cannot imagine a successful person who's a procrastinator, and you cannot imagine a person who gets things done immediately who is uh, unsuccessful in any way. So, number two is in order to overcome procrastination, you need good organization. You need good organization. You need to take the time to think and plan. You need to think, take the time to think, what is it you're trying to do? How are you trying to do it? 
What are the most important things that you've been hired to accomplish? What are your key result areas? What are your most important priorities? And so on. So what we've been talking about up to now is giving you all the tools necessary, including eliminating the time wasters and especially eliminating this one. So now you're well organized. You've got your goals. You've got your plans. It's time to go. What are the obstacles to eliminating procrastination? Well, here's one of the primary ones. We talked about it very early, and it's the difference between the urgent and the important. We said before that the urgent is seldom important, and the important is seldom urgent. But what happens is that the important things, the ones that are, are not urgent, are the ones that can contribute the most to our lives. They're also the biggest tasks, and they're the ones that have the greatest negative consequences if we don't complete them on time. What is important eventually becomes urgent. So what do we do? We don't allow ourselves enough time. We uh, hurry and try to get a lot of things done in a short period of time. We don't do them as well as we could. And our critical biggest opportunities for high performance are kicked out from under us. The natural tendency to delay on our important but not urgent tasks builds the habit of procrastination. And pretty soon, if we're not careful, we start to procrastinate on everything. Well, the fourth key to overcoming procrastination is to use procrastination in this way. Use what we call creative procrastination. Creative procrastination is another way of calling it uh, or referring to de completion by deletion. Creative procrastination says that you can't, since you can't do everything, law of forced efficiency, you have to do something. So what you do is you procrastinate on the 80% of tasks that only account for 20% of your results so that you have enough time to spend the 80% of your time on the 20% of your tasks that account for the 80% of your results. Are you with me on this? In other words, you consciously choose what subjects or what areas or tasks you're going to procrastinate on and then you deliberately refuse to do those things because they do not contribute to the most important goals you have set for yourself. We say, by the way, that intelligence, if you want the highest hallmark of intelligence, is intelligence is doing those things that move you toward the accomplishment of your most important goals. And the flip side of intelligence is lack of intelligence or stupidity, and stupidity is not doing the things that move you towards your goals or doing things that move you away from your goals. So creative procrastination is very important. What things are you not going to do so that you have time to do the things <laughs> that you have to do in order to be successful? Now, the fifth key is to launch. The fifth key in, with regard to procrastination is to launch, is to get on with it. Get on with it. The natural tendency for most people is they procrastinate, procrastinate, procrastinate. They give in to the tendency to clear up small things first. And by the way, the more you work on small things, the more they multiply, so you never get them all done. And they procrastinate. So the way that you get started on your major task is you launch. In fact, uh, a longitudinal study indicated that the ability to launch on something important is a critical factor of success. And here's a couple of techniques that you can use to get started, to launch. The, the technique, the first technique is what is called the salami slice technique. Now, when we look at a large job or task, it's usually overwhelming and it daunts us and we have a tendency to make excuses and to put off getting started until everything is just right. The salami slice technique says when you take a loaf of salami, you don't try to eat the whole thing at once. What you do is you just carve off a slice. And with regard to procrastination, you take your most important task and you write out a list, a clear plan and a list of everything that you need to do, and then you slice off one piece and you do just that. Maybe you just make a phone call. Maybe you just assemble some information. Maybe you just uh, prepare. But you slice off one small piece and you do that until it's complete. Don't worry about anything else. A second method, which is similar to this, is what is called the Swiss cheese technique. And the Swiss cheese technique says what you do is you pick a five-minute piece of the job. You punch a hole in the job by saying, I'm going to do this five-minute piece and nothing more. So you salami slice or Swiss cheese, and what it does is it gets you started. It gets you launched. Very often, by the way, once you get started, they say, well begun is half done. Once you get started, sometimes you'll have the momentum. You'll develop what they call the big mo, the momentum, and you'll start working toward getting to cheap. Now, the seventh key to overcoming procrastination is to establish a reward structure for yourself, a reward schedule. Now, a reward schedule we've talked about before just simply says this, is if you have jobs that you procrastinate on, give yourself a, an organized reward 
for each thing that you're going to do. When we talk to salespeople, for instance, we say you have to make a certain number of prospecting calls. Well, if you like coffee, do this. Instead of giving yourself a cup of coffee just when you come in, give yourself a cup of coffee after you've made five calls. Do you like cookies? Well, break up a cookie and give yourself a piece of cookie. Train yourself the way you would train a dog, if you like, with rewards, and then be very strict with yourself. This is where you see what you're made of. It's one thing to say, I'm going to give myself a reward only after I have done it. But then can you stick to it? Because if you can stick to it, not only is it a mark of character, but it will help snap this habit of procrastination. Now, number eight is develop a sense of urgency. We said earlier that senior executive officers were asked what characteristics would most put a person on the fast track. And they said the first one was to separate the relevant from the irrelevant, to do what is important, to set priorities. The second is to get on with the job and do it fast. Develop a sense of urgency. A sense of urgency is possessed by less than 2% of the population. And you know something? Just about everybody works for them. A sense of urgency means that when the job comes up, you get going. You do it now. Do it now. Do it now. You say to yourself over and over again, I do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Some companies used to get everybody together in the morning and they would say, I do it now. Do it now. Do it now. 50 times a day. And what this does is it programs this command into the subconscious so that you're unconsciously impelled into doing your most important task. A sense of urgency is one of the rarest of all qualities, but because today the biggest problem that we have is what is called time poverty. In other words, everybody feels short of time. We have more money than time in many respects. So when a person does things for us fast, get back to us fast, calls us fast, helps us fast, we consider that person to be more capable, more competent, more reliable, more dependable, smarter, more uh, uh, better performer, and, and everything. So therefore, when your boss asks you, when your customers ask you, when important people to you ask you for things, do it quickly. And this brings us to number nine. And it is that fast tempo is essential to success. Fast tempo in every study is essential to success. What does that mean? It means that successful people work quickly. They work at a higher, faster tempo. In the same period of time, imagine someone driving at 25 miles an hour and someone driving at 75 miles an hour, and they both drive for an hour. Well, at the end of the hour, the person driving at the higher speed will have covered a lot more ground. The person who works with fast tempo gets a lot more done in the same period of time. But here's another point, is when you have fast tempo, you have more energy. The harder you work, the faster you work, the more energy you have. The higher your self-esteem, the better you feel. The slower you work, the more tired you get, the more depressed, the less energy you have. So fast tempo and a sense of urgency go hand in hand with great achievement. Number 10, once you get started towards your job, don't stop. Once you get launched, don't stop. Discipline yourself, and here's where the key comes in. Discipline yourself to stay at it. Keep your head down. Keep saying, back to work, back to work, back to work. Get yourself in the physiology, the body language of high performance. But once you get started, don't stop. Just keep on going, keep on going. Now, here's another technique that you can use to overcome procrastination, and that is to start your job on the outside. Start your job on one of the smaller tasks that you have to do. You see, a task has a lot of little jobs that have to be done. It also has core jobs. So start on the outside and do something small. Another thing that you can do, if you have the right temperament, is start on the inside. And start with the core task. Start with the most important part of the job that has to be done and do that. Either one of these will often get you going. The 13th key to overcoming procrastination is start with the worst. Start with the worst possible thing that you have to do every day. There's a little joke that says that if you get up in the morning and you eat a frog first thing in the morning, what will happen is that you'll overcome procrastination because you'll know that the worst thing that could possibly happen to you has happened to you already. You've eaten a live frog. What this means is we get up in the morning and you start off with the most unpleasant task. They've done uh, several studies with regard to exercise, by the way, and they find that people who exercise first thing in the morning are several times more likely to continue exercising than people who wait until later in the day because later in the day there's always a reason to procrastinate. So therefore, start off your morning, start off your work day by doing the most unpleasant but often the most important thing first. Now, number 14. Many people are motivated to do things as a result of fear. So therefore, ask yourself, what are the negative consequences of not doing this job and getting this job done on time? What are the negative consequences? 
when you think very clearly about what might likely happen to you if you don't do the job well, often it will motivate you toward doing the job. Now, other people, number 15, are motivated by desire. How do you motivate yourself by desire? Well, you visualize the job as complete. Visualize the job as 100% complete and think of all the positive benefits that will accrue to you by doing the job and doing the job well. Best technique, use them both. Think what might happen if you don't get it done. Think what, ha what might happen when you do get it done. And the combination of those two will often impel you forward. Number 16 key is designate a particular time to work. Say, look, I am going to work for 15 minutes on this task from 8 a.m. to 8.15. And just give yourself a specific time. Now, you may give yourself 30 minutes or 90 minutes, but instead of worrying about getting the whole job done, just to designate a specific time and say, after this, I'll go on to something else. Often, this will break the back of the procrastination and will launch you into it. Number 17 key to overcoming procrastination is to pick one area where procrastination is hurting you. Now, this is important. One of the major reasons why people fail in developing new habits is when they start with a habit, they're usually highly motivated, but then the hard work begins and their motivation drops and they quit. What you need to do is instead of trying to start a whole lot of things, do just one thing. Pick one area where procrastination is hurting you. It's holding back your career and make the decision that you're going to defeat procrastination in that area. Just like a military principle, select your enemy procrastination, select the area or your choice of terrain and go to work to hammer procrastination in this particular area. The wonderful thing is this, is that overcoming procrastination in one area has a halo effect and enables you to begin overcoming procrastination in other areas. Whereas if you try to beat procrastination in your whole life, what will happen is you'll hit this dip. It's called the motivation dip. You'll hit this dip and what will happen is you won't overcome procrastination anywhere. So start off by picking one area where it's hurting you the most and go to work if it takes, takes a day, a week, a month, a firm, a visualize, plan, organize, use all of these ideas, but kill procrastination where it seems to be holding you back. And this brings us to number 18. A good plan, very carefully worked out in detail and in writing, is one of the most powerful tools of all to defeat procrastination. So sitting down and thinking through your goals very clearly, planning your goals, planning your activities, setting priorities, working out a schedule, working out a uh, project management sheet and putting it in writing is a very powerful way to launch or drop kick you into doing the job. Number 19 is to remember the 2080 rule. The 2080 rule says sometimes the first 20% of what you do accounts for 80% of your results. Sometimes what you need to do is just launch yourself into the first 20% and then you're over the hill and you're on the way down toward completion. The last two, number 20, are rationalization. Rationalization always accompanies procrastination. Rationalization is making excuses for not doing what we know we should do. So don't allow yourself to make excuses because it leads to insanity. All right, and finally, number 21 key is to set deadlines. Deadlines are a powerful way to overcome procrastination. Is set a very clear deadline for yourself, promise yourself, and promise other people that you're going to have the job done by that time. Encourage those other people to check on you. Keep them informed. Tell them how it's going. And, and, and insist to them it'll be done. And sometimes promising others will help you break the procrastination habit and put you on to the high road to success. One of your main jobs in life is to make a significant contribution to your company and to become extremely successful in your career. And your success is going to be largely based on two laws or principles. The first law is called the law of accumulation. And it says that every extraordinary achievement in human life is the result of thousands of ordinary efforts that nobody ever sees or appreciates. And the second law, which is a sub-law of this, is called the law of incremental improvement. And it says that great successes in America, successful men and women, are those who become better incrementally, a little bit at a time, every hour, every day, every month, every year. Nobody makes big jumps from where they are to where they want to be. What they do is they go to work, and especially they go to work on themselves 
to get onto the fast track and to stay on the fast track. And in this session, I'm going to give you a series of ideas, the best I've ever learned, on how you can grammatically accelerate the speed at which you grow to the top of your field. Now, let's start off with the first of all. You've heard this many, many times. The first thing you've heard is that knowledge is power. Knowledge equals power. However, it's not that simple. It's not just knowledge. It is practical knowledge that can be applied to getting the critical results in your particular field. It is knowledge that you can use to increase your value and to increase the value of your organization. So the more knowledge you take in that you can use to do something with, the more successful you'll be. In one study a little while ago, they concluded that the top people in every field were different from the others because they simply know more than the average person. They have more knowledge. It's one of the finest and fastest forms of leverage and one of the best ways to accelerate your career that you can imagine. Because we know, number two, is that information and knowledge is doubling every seven years in America in every single field. That means that in order for you to keep up, your knowledge has to double every seven years as well. In fact, we know that er today, this year, they will publish two million articles and a hundred thousand books. And in order for you to keep current, you have to double your knowledge or you don't stay in the same place, you actually start to fall behind. Now the third point is that your success in life will be in direct proportion to the amount of useful information that you have. Sometimes all you need is one key idea at the right time and the right place to totally change a situation, to, to have an insight or to see a method or a technique that you can use that can dramatically change the whole future of your business and your career. Now here's an important point with regard to information and knowledge, is that the amount of knowledge you have can be like the amount that is in a bucket or a pot. When you start off your career, the amount of information or knowledge that you have is limited. So the amount of rewards that you have is equally limited. Your rewards and your knowledge, your practical knowledge, will be equal. As you increase your knowledge, you increase your rewards. As your knowledge and information goes up, your, knowledge, your rewards go up, and as your knowledge and information go up higher and higher, your knowledge get your informa your rewards get higher and higher but here's the point your job of course is to put as much knowledge and information into this pot as possible but there's a leak there's a drain in the bottom of the pot what does it mean it means that some of your knowledge is draining out all the time it's becoming obsolete so if you stop putting new knowledge into the top of the pot you don't stay in the same place you actually start to fall back now what's one of the finest ways that you can upgrade your knowledge, stay on the fast track, keep up. And it is to read. And it is to read one hour per day. Reading one hour per day can change your life. Reading one hour per day will make you an expert in as little as three years. Reading one hour per day will make you a national authority in five years. If you read one hour per day, it'll translate into approximately one book per week. Now this doesn't mean newspapers, this doesn't mean television guides or magazines. It means reading mental protein, reading something that teaches you something, something educational, something that helps you to advance in your field. The average adult has approximately 72 discretionary hours a week. That means that you sleep eight hours, you work eight hours, you've got 72 hours left. What we're saying is take of those 72 hours and spend seven, or tithe if you like, invest 10% of your discretionary hours in your field It'll translate into a, a book a week. It'll translate into 50 books a year. It'll translate into more than 500 books in 10 years. Now, the average American, the average adult American, reads less than one nonfiction book a year. If you were to read only one nonfiction book each month, not once a week, but once a month, that would put you into the top 1% in professional development in America. So read 30 to 60 minutes each day. Read one book a week, read 50 books a year, and it'll move you to the top of your field, absolutely guaranteed. Number five, key to keeping up and staying on the fast track, is to is use what we call the Stu Leonard method. Now, what Stu Leonard is, one of the most famous retailers and grocery store operators in the world, and what he found is he reads voraciously. He reads and he takes notes. But what he does is he takes and he'll read a book, and he'll underline all the key points in that book. Then he turn the book over to his secretary, have the secretary type up, and take a, a um, not a synthesis, but a synthesis of the key ideas, type it all up, and make it available to him and to other people so that he can go over all the key ideas in a book and his staff can do the same thing too. So use the Stu Leonard method by reading books, underlining the key points, and then having somebody um, summarize them all. The sixth key point to step keeping up is to read key magazines. There are key magazines in business and there are key magazines in your field. 
and you need to keep current with them. At the same time, you need to discontinue magazine subscriptions and newsletter subscriptions and even newspaper subscriptions that don't contribute to your major goals. So read Forbes, read Fortune, read Success Magazine, read Inc. Read the key trade magazines in your field. Why? It's because the top people in every field read the magazines in their field. The inferior people read the newspapers. They read irrelevant things or they just <laughs> watch television. Number seven, use what is called the rip and read method. Most people are getting too much information and they can't handle it all, leading to what is called pileitis. We keep making piles and piles of materials that we intend to read sometime but we never get to and the material becomes more and more obsolete. So use rip and read. Now what is this? Well what you do is first thing when you get a magazine is instead of reading the magazine the way it's designed, which is to take you past all the advertising, what you do is you go straight to the table of contents, you look through the articles, you decide only the articles that you want to read, and then you go straight to the article. Go straight to the article and rip it out. Rip it out and put it into a separate file for reading later and then discard the magazine, throw it away. In other words, discipline yourself not to become distracted to read everything that's there. Read only what's important or you'll end up not only not reading what's important, you'll end up not reading anything. So use the rip and read method and put it all into a file and this is a file that you follow up with on what we call gifts of time. Now a gift of time is time that you have between meetings. Gifts of time are times that take place during transition. We often call it transition time. When you're traveling, when you're waiting for a plane, when you're waiting an appointment, you carry your file with you and you take out your file and just read through the articles. I will tell you this, it's absolutely astonishing how much material you can keep current with because in an entire article there only may be one or two ideas. By the way, always read with a red pen or with a highlighter so that you can circle, underline, or highlight the critical ideas so that you can instantly go back to those. Sometimes going back to a critical idea two or three times is all it takes to cement it into your subconscious and have it available for life. Now, number nine is learn how to read a little bit at a time in the great books. Again, we use the law of incremental improvement. Everybody wants to be a well-educated, well-rounded person. But what they have found is that if you take the great books, and there's about a hundred of them that are put out by, I believe it's the University of Chicago, if you read 15 minutes each day in the great books, you will read all the great books in the course of your lifetime. So at the end of the day, instead of reading something light or pablum, just take a great book and read 15 minutes and think about it, sometimes before you go to sleep. I was speaking to the author the other day and he said this wonderful thing. He said if each day you read one poem, one short story, and one essay, in three years you will have read a thousand poems, a thousand short stories, and a thousand essays, and you will have spent less than one hour a day. Not only that, you'll be one of the best educated people in the entire country. The equality of your thinking, your ability to use your mind to accomplish your results will expand dramatically. Now, if you're going to do a lot of reading, and by the way, some people say, well, I'm not very good at reading then learn how to read. If you didn't learn how to read in school, then take remedial reading courses because all readers are leaders. <laughs> leaders are readers and readers are leaders. So learn how to speed read. First of all, learn how to read well. Make it a, set it up as a challenge or a goal. Then learn how to speed read. Take a speed reading course. The fact is they guarantee that you will triple your reading speed in the first lesson in a speed reading course, and they're right. They do it. Use what is called the OPIR method when you read a book. The OPIR method is, first of all, overview. Take a quick look at the book outside book, the writer, the author, the jacket, the uh, quotations to decide whether you want to read it at all. One of the fastest ways to save time in reading a book is to throw the book away if it's no use to you. Second of all, do a preview. Now in a preview, what you do is you read the table of contents through and then you quickly flip through the book to look at the title headings, look at the subtitles, look at the layouts, charts, graphs, and so on to get a feel for the way the book is read. Third, you do what is called an in-view. Now an in-view, you always read for purpose. In other words, once you've done your overview and your preview, say, what do I want to get from this book? And then and your in-view, seek the purpose of what you're looking for. And number three is your review. Immediately after reading the book, do a quick review of the book. This will take about half to two-thirds of the time it takes to read a normal book, but it will double, triple, quadruple the amount of retention. Your retention level will go up to about 80% in reading a book like this. And you'll be amazed at how many books you can get through. The eleventh key to uh, high achievement and to keeping up is audio tape learning. Listen to audio tapes in your car. 
Audio tape learning was one of the greatest breakthroughs in education since the history of the development of the printing press. A, the average person ro drives 12,000 to 25,000 miles each year. That works out to 500 to 1,000 hours that you spend behind the wheel of your car each year. You know what that means? It means 12 and a half to 25 40 hour weeks, or three to six months of 40 hour weeks, or one to two university semesters. You can become one of the best educated people in America simply by listening to audio cassettes as you drive around. Audio cassette learning has changed the lives of more people than you can imagine. And remember, you're in a big competition. If you're not listening to audio cassettes, your competitor is listening to audio cassettes and is getting the edge on you. Number 12, read book condensations. There are companies that condense books in written form and in tape form so that you can get the entire essence of a book that would take you four or five hours to read in 40 or 45 minutes. So subscribe to those. I subscribe to all of them, by the way. The 13th thing that you can do to keep up with your field is go to seminars. What is a seminar? Well, a seminar is not only a learning experience, it is compressed time. For every one hour that you spend in a seminar, it takes the seminar presenter a hundred hours of study and preparation to learn and refine and distill that material and make it available for you. So you can save yourself many, many hours, which means eventually weeks, even years, by going to seminars conducted by experts. Don't go to seminars conducted by people who teach at universities. Don't read books written by people who are teachers. Read books, go to seminars, learn from people who have practical, successful experience in the field, and sometimes you'll get more information in a day or two at a seminar for a couple of hundred dollars than you could get spending hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars doing it yourself. Be an absolute seminar fanatic. Number 14, use networking. Networking is a powerful way to keep up. We found that 54% of managers who get ahead rapidly in America, 54% spend a lot of time networking. They get together with people in their field. They get together with people outside their field. They're always getting good information, good advice, good insights. They're always current with what's going on. Some of the very best information, most timely, most valuable knowledge that you will get will come from networking on a regular basis inside and outside your field. By the way, in the same study, they found there were a lot of managers who were very competent and effective at getting the job done, but because they didn't network, they were missing an enormous amount of information and stuff was going right past them. So become an excellent networker. Get together for breakfast, get together for lunch, get together on a regular basis. Number 15, and this can help you as much or more than anything else, is join professional associations. Now here's an interesting point. Of the thousands of people that are any, in any particular field, only a few people join their professional associations. Only a few people attend on a regular basis. The rest of them don't, but I'll tell you this, it's almost always the best people who are members and who are active in professional associations. So here's the key. First of all, go and listen to all the speakers. Attend all the meetings. Remember, they are under the gun and they are, have an onus to try to bring you the very best and most valuable speakers with the very best and most valuable information. Sit there and take notes copiously. Never sit there passively in a talk. Nobody's brain is good enough to absorb it. So sit down and take notes all the time. But second of all, go to all the workshops that they hold because sometimes they'll have the, some of the best educational workshops you can imagine. In my associations, I've found that joining the associations and attending all the meetings can save you five solid years of hard work in your career. And third of all is attend all the annual meetings. Remember, the annual meetings are designed to be as valuable as they possibly can for the uh, members of the association. So attend them all. It's amazing how much you can learn. Network. Get around with other people. And finally, the last one is Mbwa. This is considered one of the best ways to get timely and relevant information. What does it mean? It means get out and get among them. Move around with other people. Uh, ask them questions. See what they're doing. Ask what they're doing. 75% of effective executive, effective managers, effective people are always moving around with other people. Keep up with your field. Stay on top. Commit yourself to staying on the fast track. One of the keys to success in relationships is communication. 
in all successful relationships, the partners will always say that they communicate extremely well. And wherever communications break down or slow down or don't take place, you start to have problems. And one of the keys to effectiveness in the world of work is your ability to communicate, to communicate effectively and well. In fact, even if you work in technical fields like computer programming or engineering, you spend as much as 75% of your time communicating and interacting with other people. So your effectiveness as a person is determined by your effectiveness in getting your message across and in getting the message clearly that the other person is sending. The starting point is to accept 100% responsibility for everything that you send and for everything that you receive, for both being heard and for hearing. The quality of your life is largely determined by the quality of your communications. And by the way, there's two forms of communications. The first form is your interpersonal communications, the way you talk to yourself and dialogue with yourself and think and plan to yourself. And the other form of communications is the way you interact with others. And of course, one affects the other. So let's start off from the top. Number one is 75% of your time is spent communicating. The, qu not the, question, the question is not whether or not you are a good communicator, but whether or not you're going to be a good communicator because there's nothing more essential. We also know that one of the greatest time wasters in the world of work is poor communications. We communicate poorly in several areas. We delegate poorly. We have aimless meetings that go round and round in circles. We have aimless talks about trying to solve problems and nobody knows what the problem is. We have incorrect delegation. We have poor priority setting. We have misunderstandings that take place and nobody says anything. One person hears one thing, but what the other person said was something totally different. In fact, if your communications were excellent, you would be an outstanding time manager. So number three, according to the studies of CEOs, 84% of your success in the world of work is going to be determined by how effectively you communicate with other people. Now, there are three ways that you communicate in the world of work, the three key tools of the executives, and this may change your entire orientation toward communication. Number one is one-on-one -on -one conversations. How you get along one-on-one -on -one is a critical determinant of everything that happens to you. Why? It's because almost all of your success is determined by what others say and do and think about you and how you interact with them is critical. The second is your ability to communicate in meetings or in presentations in front of several other people. Many careers are made and lost because of an individual's ability or inability to communicate effectively in a meeting. People who sit in meetings and don't say anything are shooting themselves in the foot. And the third type of communications is on, in written form, is being able to write out in written form clearly what you're trying to say. Your ability to communicate effectively in all three of these are absolutely critical to your success in getting your point across to others. Now, the fourth key to communications is like what we call the key to uh, success in picking real estate. We say in real estate it's location, location, <laughs> location. In communications it is clarity, clarity, clarity. Remember we said clarity with regard to goals, clarity with regard to objectives, clarity with regard to priorities. And in communications, every communication breakdown takes place because of a lack of clarity. And here are the keys to clarity. First of all, time. Take time to fully understand and to be understood. Second of all, attention. Pay very close attention to the content and the syntax of the message. Attention will enable you to see and hear things that other people will miss. And the third is uh, patience. Be sure that you have the patience to listen thoroughly and never assume that you know what the person is going to say. The sixth key to communication, I'm sorry, the fifth key is delegation. Or the fifth key problem, let's put it this way, is delegation. Poor delegation is a major single challenge in the world of work. It's so important that we'll talk about it in a few minutes. But when we delegate poorly, we assign the wrong job or we assign it at the wrong time to the wrong person with the wrong priorities and the wrong outcomes and the job has to be done over again is a major single cause of lost time and lost money in businesses. So your ability to delegate is a critical communications tool. Number six is lack of focus. A lack of focus, which it comes back to our problem with, clar with, uh, with clarity, means fuzziness with regard to communications. Fuzziness with regard to what we want done, when we want it done, how we want it done, what our goals and objectives are, and so on. That's why we kept coming, keep coming back to the question, what am I trying to do? How am I trying to do it? Am I using this the best way? Is this the best way to do it? 
So where, what are the areas of your work life and your home life where fuzziness exists? And wherever there is fuzzy communication, there will be fuzzy results. A seventh reason for poor communications is no priorities. We've talked extensively about the importance of priorities, which means basically to determine what is more important and what is less important, to determine what has to be done first, what has to be done second, to determine the 80-20 rule. What are the 20% of things that we do that account for 80% of results? In fact, the number one key to your success is your ability to communicate priorities and to work on priorities, which means to find out what the priorities are and especially to convey the priorities to others. Whenever I work with my staff, whenever I give them a job to do, I always attach to it a priority rating. This has to be done immediately. This has to be done this week. This has to be done when you catch up and, or when you get ahead and so on. Now here's the key to delegation. Coming back to this. Delegation is critically important because delegation enables you to expand your output from what you can do to what you can control. Let me repeat that. Delegation enables you to expand or multiply the value of yourself from what you can do personally to what you can control. Poor delegation, on the other hand, not learning how to do it, is a major reason for time loss. So here's the keys to delegation. First of all, think. The Thomas J. Watson reminder, think. What exactly is the job? Think through the job first. B is to match the person with the job. Ask yourself, think carefully, take the time, who would be the best person to do this job? So match the person with the job properly. Matching the wrong person with the job is a major time waster because of the problems and difficulties. Now C is to discuss the job and to describe the ideal result with the chosen person. In other words, if this job is done right, perfectly, what will it look like? Explain clearly what it is you want. D is to have the person feed it back to you. So the person can feed it back and say, this is what you are asking me to do. Feedback takes a little bit of time, but saves, as they say, a stitch in time saves nine. The E is explain to the person what authority and what resources they will have available. What will they have to do the job? D, D is set a deadline on the job. When does the job exactly have to be done? A job without a deadline is simply a meaningless discussion. And C, D, E, F, G, I'm sorry, is that last one, is set a time for review so that you are clear when you're going to review and inspect what you expect. Inspect what you expect. What we have found is if you do not inspect the job and arrange to expect the job on a regular basis, it simply doesn't get done. At least it doesn't get done the way you want it to get done. Now, number nine, regards to communication with your own boss. What do you need to communicate? Well, first of all, you need to know with tremendous clarity exactly what your job is. Do you know what the number one reason for stress in the world of work is? It's not knowing what's expected. It's working hard, but not knowing exactly what's expected. So with your boss, be absolutely clear with regard to the tasks, and absolutely clear with regard to the priorities. Which comes first? Which comes second? Ask your boss, why am I on the payroll? What have I been hired to accomplish? Now. One of the things which I suggest that people do with your boss is take your boss a list and give your boss a list of your jobs and ask your boss to organize the list in order of priority. Ask your boss to tell you which comes first, which comes second, which comes third, which comes fourth. Tell your boss you can't do everything, but you need to know clearly what is the most important thing. Now here's the rule. Your boss's top priority must be your top priority. If you want to put the foot on the accelerator of your own career, make your boss's top priority your type pri top priority, and you'll never make a mistake. Number 10, decision making. Problem solving and decision making. Here's the key. Enormous amount of time is spent wasting time going around in circles trying to solve problems in any organization. So here are the keys to solving any problem, making any decision. First key is to define the problem clearly. What exactly is the problem? Define it clearly so that everybody involved understands and agrees that yes, this is the problem. B, ask yourself, what are all the causes of this problem? How and why did this problem occur? You do this so that you can make sure you eliminate the causes so the problem doesn't repeat itself. C, ask yourself, what are all the possible solutions to this problem? D, you ask yourself, what is the best solution? And you ask everybody else until you agree step by step 
what are the solutions, what is the best solution, E, make a decision. Once you come to the determination on what the best decision is, best solution is make a decision. E is to assign responsibility, who is going to do it. And finally, the last key over and over again is to set a deadline. A job or a decision without a deadline <laughs> somehow doesn't seem to get done. Number 11, once you have decided on the solutions, become solution-oriented. A solution-oriented person is a much more effective person in terms of time than a person who's not. So then talk about the solutions. Focus on the future. Focus on the future over the past. Talk about the solutions rather than the problems. Focus on the future over the past. Become intensely solution-oriented. When people come in and say, we have this problem, we have that problem, so on, you say, what is the solution? What do we do from here? What is the thing that we do tomorrow? How do we resolve this situation? Rather than in getting lost in the rest of it. Number 12 in communication, look at what are called authority levels. In confusion over authority levels often leads to poor communications. There are three types of decisions that you make in any organization. Decision number one is a command decision. Make sure people know what this is. This is a decision that you make alone. Only you can make it. Number two type of decision is a consultative decision. A consultative decision is a decision that you take with input from other people. You ask other people their advice, you take the advice, you think it through, and then you act. The third type of decision is a consensus decision. A consensus decision is a decision that's made on the basis of democracy. In other words, the majority rules. If a person is discussing something with you, and they think it's a consensus decision, and their opinion is equally valuable, but in your mind it's a consultative or a command decision, you're not only going to have communication problems, you're going to have ego problems. And when you have bruised ego problems, you know you can spend as much as half of your time settling people down whose feelings have been hurt because they misunderstood. Number 13 is delegate everything that you possibly can so that you can have enough time to do any of the things that you need to do. One of the most important of all rules is to delegate, delegate, delegate. Delegate 100% of everything that anybody else can do. Here's the rule. Use what is called the 70% rule. The 70% rule says, rather than taking the job on yourself, ask yourself, who can do this job 70% as well as you? And then give that job to that person, rather than, than falling back into the temptation to take it yourself. Number 14 is networking. Networking is one of the most powerful of all communication tools. It enables you to get out and get among people, and as we said in the last session, 54% of managers who get promoted rapidly are known as great networkers. Why is there always communicating, interacting? Remember the quality of your communications, your interactions with other people, the quality and quantity is going to determine your success as much or more than any other single factor in your life. Number 15 with regard to communications is a task focus. Now a task focus means the very best of all conversations are conversations that are focused on the job, focused on getting the job done. In fact, the healthiest, most positive relationships in the world of work are when people have a task focus. What is the opposite? It's an interpersonal focus, where people are always talking about people and personalities. Whenever you have, you've lost a task focus and people are spending too much time talking about other people and what they think and what they feel and what's going on and the dynamics between people, you have poor organization and overstaffing. People have simply too much time on their hands or they don't know clearly what it is they're supposed to do in order of priority, when they're supposed to do it, and so on. Which brings us to number 16 with regard to communication. It's the difference between managing versus operating. If you're very successful at operating, which is doing the job, you will move up from operating to managing. You will, as we said earlier, expand from what you can do to what you can control. But the natural tendency whenever you have a difficulty is that you will revert back to operating. So resist this tendency. The number one reason for failure in the executive suite is people fall back to operating instead of managing. Resist upward delegation. Don't let people delegate their tasks back to you. When a person gives you a task, your job is to get them to do the job. Number 18, we're almost to the back here, teach your subordinates how to do parts of your job. One of the fastest ways to use your communication skills to improve your output is to teach other people what to do. And number 19 is to outsource. One of the very best ways that you can use your communication skills to increase your productivity, your output, your effectiveness, and your performance is to outsource everything that you possibly can. Anything that anyone else can possibly do inside and outside your company, you should get them to do in order to be an excellent communicator.
Balancing work and family is one of the most important of all considerations in the way you organize your time and your life. And we start off with this critical principle. Number one is that your happiness should be your chief aim in life. You want somebody else's happiness, but your happiness. Your happiness shouldn't be second, it should be first. Because here's the rule. If ever you make somebody else's happiness or something else more important than your happiness, you may get that, but you won't ever be happy. Uh, Abraham Lincoln once said, the very best way to help the poor is not to become one of them. The very kindest thing that you can do for other people is to be happy yourself. And this brings us to point number two. Point number two is fully 85% of your happiness comes from your relationships with other people. Fully 85% of your happiness comes from your relationships. Now what this also means is that fully 85% of all your problems also come from your relationships with other people. And one of the primary reasons why we have problems in our relationships, especially the most important ones, is because we don't spend enough time and we don't spend the right quality and quantity of time with them, which we'll deal with in this session. So here's the starting point. Here's a good question. It's how would you spend your time if you learned today that you only had six months to live? How would you spend your time if you learned today that you only had six months to live? We asked this question earlier in this course, but the second part of this is with whom? Who would you spend the time with predominantly? What would you want to do with that person? Where would you want to go? How would you want to spend it? What would you want to get accomplished if you learned today that you only had six months to live? You see, the answer to this question will bring you face to face with what is really important to you. Sometimes in our sessions we say, imagine that it wasn't six months, but it was six weeks. Or that it wasn't six weeks, but suddenly you learned it was six days, and then six hours, and then 60 minutes. If you learned this very moment that you only had 60 minutes left in life, what would you do and how would you spend your time? Who would you want to talk to? Who did you think about when you thought about that question? Because that tells you a lot about what's really important to you. And this brings us to number four, which is one of two of the most famous of Greek sayings. The first one is moderation in all things. Moderation in all things is what the ancient Greek said, and as a wise old man said, yes, but except for a few glorious exceptions. <laughs> Moderation in all things means that you need balance between your work and your family life in order to be happy and in order to be successful. How can you tell when you're out of balance? You always experience being out of balance with stress, with anxiety, with irritation, with sleepless nights with sometimes psychosomatic illnesses. Whenever you're out of balance in your life, you begin to feel it and it begins to manifest itself in your relationships with other people. So the starting point of getting your life into balance, number five, is to begin with your values. We talked about this before, but ask again. What are your values and what is really important to you? What's really important to you? What do you really care about? Because it's only when you absolutely know what's most important to you that you start to feel happy. And here's the rule. Either you run your life by determining what's important to you, organizing the sequence of events, or your life runs you. And many people today are frantic and they're happy, unhappy, and they're anxious and they're tense for a very specific reason. And it's because their life is running them because they have not put their hands onto the steering wheel of their own life and they're not steering it. An important part of balance is for you to describe what is called the uh, ideal end result, your ideal vision, or what we say your ideal lifestyle. What is your ideal lifestyle? If you could live any kind of life that you wanted, what would it be? What would it include? What ingredients would make you the most happy? What ingredients would make you the most happy? Answering this question enables you to do what we call gap analysis. Gap analysis is where you look at your life today and you look at your life as it would be if it were perfect. And you look at the differences between where you are and where you want to be and you ask yourself, what changes would you have to make to begin to create your ideal life, especially with regard to the most important people in your life? And here's one of the most important points of balance. It's to set peace of mind as your highest goal. Peace of mind is in reality the highest human good, it's the aim of everything we do in life. It's the foundation of all psychology and philosophy and religion and everything else.
but you need to set it as your highest goal and then refuse to compromise your peace of mind. And here's the most remarkable discovery. When you set peace of mind, your own personal inner happiness and contentment as your highest goal, you'll probably never make another mistake. You'll receive unerring guidance, always to do the right thing at the right time. And then if you refuse to ever compromise your peace of mind, you'll become a person of character and strength and inner integrity and personal confidence. So here's a question for you, A. What gives you your greatest peace of mind? Analyze it. Ask, identify. What gives you the most peace of mind? What makes you feel the very best? What situation? What people? What is going on in the present or what has happened in the past that makes you feel the best? And B. What detracts from your peace of mind? What kind of thoughts? What kind of people? What kind of situations make you the most anxious or the most uneasy or the most tense? And what can you do to start having more of A and less of B? Now, number eight is remember this, that dissatisfaction and unhappiness always arise when your goals and activities on the one hand and your values on the other hand are not congruent. Goal congruency with your activities or with your values is absolutely essential. It means that you must be living your life and doing what is most important to you. And whenever you're not, you feel out of stress. So ask yourself this question. In what part of your life do you experience the most stress? In what part of your life do you feel tense or anxious or like you're running or do you feel under pressure? Almost invariably, it's because you're doing something that's inconsistent with your very highest and best good. Point number nine in balance is this. Treat your time like money. Treat your time like money and always ask, how can you best spend it for maximum happiness? How can you spend your time in such a way that it gives you the greatest payoff, that it gives you the greatest amount of satisfaction in life? The tenth key to balance is very simple. It's to do more of one thing, you must do less of another. To do more of one thing, you must do less of another. So here's my question. What do you have to do more of and what do you have to do less of in order to get your life back in balance and when do you start? When do you start doing more of one thing and less of another or less of one thing and more of another? Remember as we said before, setting priorities in getting balance means setting posteriorities as well. Number 11, remember that love is the most important thing in the world. Love is not just a happy emotional thing that you get occasionally. Love is absolutely central to mental and emotional well-being. In fact, one psychologist once said, everything we do in life is either to get more love or to compensate for lack of love. So here are the keys to dealing with love. First of all, accept that love is not peripheral. Love is central. Make your family central to your life, not peripheral. Put it in the middle of your life. Plan your whole life around your family. B, treat your spouse, who is the most important love relationship in your life, with special care, which means with kindness, with courtesy, with consideration. Treat your spouse as though he or she were the most important person in the world, because in most cases, he or she is. And number 11C is the universal maxim of Immanuel Kant which is the question you ask in considering everything, which is what kind of a family would my family be if everyone in it were just like me? Try to see your family through your own eyes. Try to look at your family from the perspective of how would they act or feel or behave if I treated them the way they treat me, if they treated me the way I treat them. And if you always practice the golden rule with your family, you'll be amazed at how much more uh, sensitive you are to the things you can do or not do that make a difference. Now, number 12, here's the key to balance. I travel 120 to 150 days a year, and people ask me this all the time, and here it is. The key to balance, do just two things. Especially when your children are growing up, do just two things. And the two things are work and family. It's as simple as that. You see, the major mistake that we make is when we're growing up, we take on an enormous number of things to do, but what happens when we get married and have children and responsibilities, we take on more and more and more, but we don't drop anything off. 
What you have to do is you have to put all of these other things aside. Now, in doing just two things, number 13 is work all the time you work. Work all the time you work. This is the key to balance. Work all the time you work. Now, here's what happens. Too many people spend too much of their time fooling around at work. What you have to do is you have to put more of yourself into your work. Because every minute that you spend fooling around at work, socializing and wasting time, which causes your work to accumulate, need, causes you to have to take it home in the evenings and on the weekends, is time that you're taking away from your family. So work all the time you work. When you go to work, work 100%, full blast all the time. Don't let anybody waste your time or detract time from your work, which brings us to number 14. The other part of balance is when you're with your family, be there 100% of the time. Don't be there physically with the rest of your body watching television, looking out the window, talking on the telephone, reading the newspapers, and so on. When you're with your family, practice focused attention and be there 100% of the time. Be right there, if you like, in their face. You know, it's an interesting statistic, but according to the American PTA Association, the average parent spends less than 30 minutes per week in one-on-one, -on -one, face-to-face interaction with their child. You wonder why we have problems with some of our children? It's because parents don't spend time with them. Number 15 is cut back on all the things that cut into family time. Cut back on newspapers. Remember when you read a newspaper, when one of your members of your family is there and wants to communicate with you, what you're saying is the newspaper is more important than you are. Cut back on television. Cut back on radio. Cut back on outside activities and aimless socializing because everything that you do that is one of these things is time that you're taking away from the most important people in your life. Number 16, spend unbroken chunks of time with the most important people in your life. In order to learn to love someone, in order to get really close to someone, you've got to spend a lot of time with them. You can't do it sporadically. I often recommend that people take car trips where you can sit in the car with a person for an hour or two or three hours. It's amazing what you learn spending those unbroken chunks of time. Now, here's a rule. Spend 60 minutes every day with your spouse, not talking about work, not talking about money, but talking about family and life and the future. Now, here's the most important rule of all. It's the foundation rule of this whole session. It's the most important thing I've ever learned in balance. It's this. It's quantity of time at home, and it's quality of time at work. It's quantity of time at home, and it's the quality of time you spend at work. And here's the key. Don't mix them up. Most people make the mistake of mixing them up and spend try to spend quantities at work and quality at home, and it doesn't work. As a child psychologist said recently, I never met a child in trouble who said, I wish my parents had spent more quality time with me. Number 18, remember, you're always free to choose. You're always free to choose. You're always free to set priorities. You're always free to choose the order or the sequence of events. Is that you always choose what's most important to you. So the most important thing of all is in balancing home and family, balancing the most important people in your life with your work, always put them first. Always put them on the top. And remember, all, the whole purpose of time management is this. The purpose of time management is to enable you to get more things done on the outside so that you have more time to spend with the most important people in your life. The one thing that makes you unique from every other human being in the world is the way you think. It's the quality of your mind, and the, especially the way you think about your time and your life. And if you think more effectively, if you think more positively, if you think more constructively about yourself, your time, your life, your activities, your relationships, your work, and so on, you actually improve them all. So in this session, I want to talk to you about the qualities of thinking of truly superior men and women and show you how you can develop them on an ongoing basis as you go about your day-to-day -day life. The first thing I want to talk about is what is called the development of a personal philosophy of time. 
a personal philosophy of time. Now, personal philosophy of time also means a personal philosophy of life. What is life? What does it mean? What does it stand for? And in life, there are two basic worldviews, and basically they're at opposite ends of the pole, and sometimes we fall in the middle. But the first worldview is a benevolent worldview. People with a benevolent worldview are those who have a positive mental attitude, generally speaking, toward themselves and their life. They believe in their own potential. They believe in love and life and beauty. They believe in growing to the realization of their full capabilities. They believe that uh, life is pretty good and that they can have a major impact. They can make a contribution and do something substantial with their lives. People with a benevolent worldview are the movers and shakers and the builders of all of time. Now, the other type of people are those who have a malevolent worldview. These are people who have a negative mental attitude, if you like, and they have, first of all, a negative mental attitude toward themselves. They have a ne negative mental attitude toward other people, toward the world. They see injustice and oppression. They see unhappiness and misery. They see unfairness and people having a hard life. They have a tendency to be angry and to be have low self-esteem, but always a malevolent worldview requires someone or something else to blame, someone or something to criticize, something to be down on. That's why you find that people with a malevolent worldview are always in contra-opposition, or if you like, in conflict with people with a benevolent worldview. In order for you to achieve your potential, remember the most important people, the most productive people, the most creative people are always those who have a benevolent, positive, constructive worldview, and that's your goal. Now, the second part of a philosophy of time management is to take the long view. This is so important, but Dr. Edward Banfield of Harvard University studied success for years and years in this context. He said, what are the characteristics of people that cause them to move up socioeconomically in the course of their lifetime? What are the predictors of upward social evolution? And what he found out was that long-time perspective was the critical factor, that this is an attitude. And people with long-time perspective, as we mentioned briefly before, are those who take a look at where they are now and where they want to be in 20 years. And they make sure that everything that they're doing today is going to help them in the long term. They are willing to work hard today knowing that the payoff will come much, much later. And as you go up socioeconomically, you find that people's time perspective stretches out further and further. So develop the long view. Now, when we say developing the long view, we mean that people with the long view are willing to sacrifice in the short term for benefits in the long term. They're willing to study and prepare and plan and work. They're willing to practice the law of accumulation, which says that Every great achievement is an accumulation of hundreds and thousands of efforts that a person puts in that nobody ever sees, but a person is willing to do it, realizing that the payoff will be tremendous. Taking a time management course or program and learning these things is an investment of time with a payoff that can last for a long time. Now, the third key, which comes out of the long view, is the ability to delay gratification. Economists agree that the number one reason why people or even economies fail it's because of the inability to delay gratification. They want to spend all of their time, all of their money now. They want to have fun and do what is fun and easy rather than what is hard and necessary. W. Clement Stone said, If you cannot save money, then the seeds of greatness are not in you. If you cannot save money, then the seeds of greatness are not in you. If you cannot delay gratification and engage in short-term pain for long-term gain, then the seeds of greatness are not in you. One of the most valuable things that we can teach our children and teach our staff is to think in the long term. All of us, over the course of our lives, want to develop character. And character has been defined several ways. One defi definition I like is that character is the ability to follow through on a resolution after the enthusiasm with which the resolution was made has passed. So taking this course, by the way, you will make a lot of decisions and commitments and resolutions. The true measure of character is whether or not you have the capacity to follow through. Character, in effect, is self-discipline in action. Character is self-discipline in action. You can tell how much character you have by how willing you are to discipline yourself to make the sacrifices that are necessary in the short term to have a great life in the long term. Now, once you've done this, number five is to take the short view. A key part of time management is to take the short view, which means to measure out your time in minutes. We find the most productive people in our society, the most important, the most prominent, are those who are the most fastidious about their time management. They measure out their time in 10-minute chunks, like accountants and lawyers and doctors, whereas unsuccessful people measure out their times in half days and full days 
and weeks. So take the short view. Be fastidious about your time. Following that is know where your time goes. Know where your time goes. Take the time to think. Know where your time goes so that you can ask yourself if this is how you want to spend your time. Analyze it. Keep a list of how you spend your time. Look and ask yourself all the time, is this, is this consistent with what I want to do and what I want to accomplish? And number seven is learn how to say no. Just say no if a particular activity does not contribute to the highest value use of your time. Just say no if something is not helping you. Use the techniques of delay, whoops, delay, in order to gain time to think about whether or not you want to do something. One of the best techniques I've ever used and discovered is what is called the 24-hour technique. No matter what anybody wants you to do, ask for 24 hours to think about it. Think about it overnight. Think about it over the weekend. Think about how you're going to say no and just say no to anything that does not contribute to accomplishing things that are important to you. Now, an eighth key in developing a philosophy of time management is to remember that time equals money. Time equals money. If a person asks you for a certain amount of time, or if an activity takes a certain amount of time, ask yourself, how much money would you be willing to exchange for the successful completion of that activity? If you want to earn a certain amount of money, ask yourself, how much time, how much of your time are you willing to spend? How much of your money are you willing to contribute? Successful people always look at time and money, and they realize that the two are interchangeable. Now, here's another important point. You can invest time to get more money. You can invest money to get more time. And time and money put together equal happiness. Happiness or life, we can call it life, but basically happiness is a better word. So always exchange time for happiness. Always exchange money for happiness. Always realize that they're interchangeable and that you can either invest them or you can spend them. If you invest them, you'll have a return. If you spend them, then they're gone forever. And this brings us to the ninth key in developing a philosophy, which is that you need to look at everything that you're expected to do based on your hourly rate. If your desired hourly rate is 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 dollars an hour, then you ask yourself, is what I am doing now paying my hourly rate? Is what I'm doing now worth my hourly rate? Or ask yourself this way, if you're reading the newspaper or watching television or sitting around socializing, is would you, would you pay another person your hourly rate to engage in this activity? How much would you pay per hour to have a person watch television for you? When you're watching television, you should ask yourself, how much would I pay per hour to watch this television show? The average person doesn't realize that the amount of time that they spend watching television is in itself, if it were used to upgrade your skills and abilities, it's in itself enough to make you rich over the course of your working lifetime. A television can cost you thousands of dollars, even tens of thousands of dollars a year if you don't think about the fact that when you're watching television, you're not doing something that is increasing your productivity. And this brings us to number 10, one of the most important of all laws in developing a philosophy. It's the law of comparative advantage. The law of comparative advantage is an economic law that says that you should always hire or pay someone else to do something that can be done if they can be paid a lower hourly rate than the rate that you desire. For instance, if your goal is to earn $25 an hour, and it costs $6 an hour to mow your lawn or wash your car, you should always hire someone to do that. You should always pay someone else at a lower hourly rate so that you can free up your time to perform higher value activities. All of companies and organizations are designed around this. The individual starts off doing everything, and then as a company becomes busier and more successful, what the individual does is they hire people to do lower value activities so you can spend more time doing higher value activities. Don't ever do $5 an hour work if you want to earn $25 an hour. Don't ever work on low value activities if you want to earn the results that come from completing high value activities. Remember, time is the one irreplaceable, indispensable resource of accomplishment. Is that all accomplishment, all achievement requires time. And if you use it on something of low value, it's gone forever, it's perishable, and you don't have it, to work on things that are really important to you. Number 11, remember that time management is a lifelong skill. It's a lifelong commitment. It's not something that you learn and that you put aside. Time management is a discipline, but it's like physical exercise. It's like eating. It's like sleeping. It's like hygiene, brushing your teeth. 
You have to work on it continuously. Every single day you have to get up and you have to think consciously about how you're going to manage your time, how you're going to use it today. Remember, time is life. So you have to think continually about how you're going to use your life more effectively. Number 12, lead by example. One of the characteristics of leaders is that leaders lead by example. Leaders have a tendency to look upon themselves and be aware of the impact that their activities and what they're doing is having on others. Leaders are aware that they are role models. So if you want to be an excellent time manager, one of the psychological techniques you can use, as we discussed right at the beginning, is to imagine that everyone is watching you. Imagine that you are setting the standard and that everybody's going to manage their time the way you manage yours. Ask yourself this question. What kind of a company would my company be if everybody in it managed their time just like me? What kind of a family would my family be if everybody used their time in it just like me? And always be asking yourself, as an example, would your world be a better or superior world if everybody did just what you did? The superior person thinks about this all the time. The inferior person puts this aside and refuses to deal with it. Now, the 13th key in developing a philosophy of time management is the importance of balance. The importance of balance, which means the importance of moderation. The Greeks said that moderation in all things is the key to a happy life, moderation. Now, sometimes people say, well, I don't have time for my family. I don't have time to exercise. I don't have time for this and time for that. Whenever you find yourself getting out of sync with regard to balance, and especially when you feel that you don't have the time, is when you most need to stop and think. So here's the question to ask. What would I do if I only had six months to live? If you find yourself working too hard or not spending time in your relationships, not spending time with the people you care about and who care about you, then ask yourself, what would I do if I only had six months to live? And if what you would do is you'd spend more time with the important people in your life, the time to start spending that time is now. So what would you do if you had six months to live? You know, it's an old joke that doctors say is that they never met a businessman on his deathbed who said, boy, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that balance and moderation in all things increases your productivity, increases your efficiency. And remember, the only reason you're working is so that you can enjoy the great things of life, which are your people, your relationships, the things that make you happy, uh, and so on. Number 14, which brings us to that, is that relaxing, letting go, vacations are a wonderful use of time is that you need to recuperate. You need to recharge your batteries. So one of the smartest things to do at the beginning of the year is plan all of your vacations in advance. Send them the money. Book the travel facilities and the hotel facilities. Book your vacations in advance and schedule your work around your vacations. Take three-day weekends whenever possible. Take a week or two weeks off in the summer and the winter time, but learn to relax. Also, learn to exercise. Exercising is a valuable use of your time. The more you exercise, the healthier you are, the more energy you are, have, the more creative you are, and the more capable you are of doing better work when you work. Number 15, make sure that your goals and your values are congruent. Make sure that you're doing the things every day that you love to do. Make sure that you're doing things that you care about and that what you're doing every day makes you happy. Number 16, have regular health exams. Remember that your health is one of the most important parts of your life. Get regular dental checkups, get regular physical checkups. Number 17, eat lightly. Eat light lunches, eat light dinners. You'll have more energy, you'll be less drowsy, and you'll be more productive. Number 18, make a decision to live to be 80. This is perhaps the most important single part of a philosophy of time management, is that you make the decision that you're going to live to be 80 years old and that you organize all of the days and hours of your life so that you feel healthy, you feel happy, you feel terrific, and if you do, you will live to be 80 and you'll enjoy every single minute of it.